Millions of people around the world board an airplane every single day. I'm often one of them. I've flown on multiple airlines, an average of probably 40, 50 days a year for over two decades now. I have just over 1.8 million miles flown just on Delta, and luckily, I have only died in one plane crash. Obviously kidding. I have not been lucky, though, to never have been in a crash. All my flights have made it safely back onto the ground, which is statistically exactly what is supposed to happen. What almost always happens, and I've almost always made it to my intended destination. Almost all flights do make it to their destinations, perhaps later than expected or maybe without some of the baggage, but uh, they do make it there in one piece nearly every time. Per some recent 2023 stats coming out of India, for every 16.7 million flights, only one will experience a fatal crash. That is pretty damn safe. Far safer than being in a car. According to a U.S. aviation site, your odds of dying in an aviation accident are 1 in 11 million. Your odds of dying in a car crash? 1 in 5,000. Flying is so much safer than driving. But for many of us, it just doesn't feel that way, does it? So why is that? Well, for those of us who are not flying the plane, it's because the flight is not in our control. Someone else is controlling our fate. And many of us meat sacks, we really don't like that. Especially in a situation when, if we're not a pilot, even if they were to give control to us, we still wouldn't have a clue how to safely land the plane. Hoping that whoever does know how to land it will do so and understanding that we are cockadoodle doomed if they don't, that seems to be the scariest part of flying for many of us. Right? Another scary part is knowing that if a significant mechanical malfunction occurs, it won't just send our car limping out into the side of the road. It'll send us falling from the sky, landing in a fiery explosive impact with the earth awaiting below or being violently torn apart or smashed while entering a large body of water. When we board a commercial flight, we accept that for the most part, our safety is no longer in our control from the time the plane takes off to the time it lands. We put our trust in not just the pilots on board, but in the hands of hundreds of people working together to ensure that the plane gets from point A to point B. Maybe what's so scary about flying is that when airplane tra- while air- airplane travel is far safer than other modes of transportation like driving or biking, when things do go wrong, when one of those hundreds of people made a, a, a tragic error, it can be catastrophic. When we think of airplane-related tragedies, we think of events like 9-11, the Andes flight disaster, planes that go missing and are never found like Malaysia Airlines Flight 370, balls of fire in the sky, that sort of thing. The 227 passengers who boarded MH370 on March 8, 2014, they were ordinary people, just like you or me. I know a couple have been suspected of being terrorists, and we'll address that, but it's a possibility that never gained a lot of traction. In all likelihood, the passengers were regular old folks, and maybe that's what makes this disappearance so much scarier. It would be easier to put this mystery behind if we at least knew that terrorists did board the plane, very likely hijacked it, still scary. But in general, what is known is scarier than what is unknown, right? With what is known, you can at least play the mental game of, in this instance, well, if terrorists are on my plane, uh, I'll have a fighting chance of stopping them. But if you don't know why a flight leaves its flight path behind, it just disappears, you don't know what hypothetically you would have to fight. 227 passengers purchased tickets for a red-eye flight from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia to Beijing, China, a flight that was a regular daily route between the two cities, a route that had never had any serious problems before. They were expected to land at 6.40 a.m. MH370 set out on its final communi- or sent out its final communication at 1.19 a.m. as the pilots flew into Vietnamese airspace. At 1.21, someone on board disabled the plane's transponder, the system that gives identifying information to air traffic control, or it malfunctioned, whatever the reason, no one was able to make contact with the plane after that. Almost seven hours later, at 8, 11 a.m., something went horribly wrong, or perhaps something went wrong hours earlier. Well, definitely something went wrong hours earlier, and this was the result of whatever terrible thing happened. Either way, the plane had now traveled hundreds and hundreds of miles off the original flight path. We know that the plane was last detected by a satellite over the Indian Ocean before it made a final sharp turn and disappeared. Everything after that, And honestly, much of what happened before that remains a mystery. Some experts believe that the plane flew up to seven hours on autopilot before it ran out of fuel and crashed into the Indian Ocean. Seven hours on autopilot. Seven hours when everyone on board may have already been dead. Or seven hours when almost everyone on board was dead. Perhaps everyone but whoever may have sabotaged the flight. Despite a years-long search covering close to uh, 100,000 square miles of ocean, millions of square miles were initially suspected of being where the plane might have ended up. Still today, as I record this, no one has found the plane nor its passengers. 
few pieces of debris have washed up on the beaches of several countries in the years following the crash, though. So maybe, just maybe, the flight didn't zip through a wormhole or something. Or maybe it did, but not all of the plane made it through. But seriously, we know still very little. The pieces found have done almost nothing to answer many of the questions about what happened to MH370. Conspiracy theories are still abundant, from a terrorist hijacking plot, alien abduction, an Asian Bermuda Triangle mystery, a government cover-up, to the sad and most widely accepted theory that one of the pilots committed a mass murder-suicide. For whatever reason, 227 passengers and 12 crew members, either all or almost all of whom probably expected March 8th, 2014 to be a normal day, never came home. And at this point, most likely will never be returned home for a proper burial. In this week's episode, we'll discuss some more stats about the safety of air travel, other mysterious plane disappearances throughout history, and the last doomed flight of Malaysia Airlines 370, and the lengthy investigation and conspiracy theories that followed, and I'll come to my conclusion of what I think happened in another mystery, what the hell did really happen edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald, and you're listening to Time Suck. (laughs) You're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday, Meat Sacks, and welcome to the Cult of the Curious. I'm Dan Cummins, the Suck Master. Danny Baloney! Danny Bag of Donuts! Danny Big, uh, but not disproportionate fanny, and you are listening to Time Suck. A couple announcements, and we'll get into the show. Uh, hail Nimrod, hail Lucifina, praise Bojangles, and glory be to Triple M. Uh, have you decided to come see me in Spokane yet? August 4th or 5th? Or in Richmond, Virginia, September 8th or 9th? Burlington, Vermont, Buffalo, New York? The Vic at the Chicago Comedy Festival on November 3rd or in Providence, Rhode Island, Lexington, Kentucky, or Virginia Beach. All right, just uh, come to the show. Bring Tony Hee Hee, Lonnie Laughs a Lot, Cindy Claps and Shit, Henry Hoots and Hollers. Uh, Tickets available at dancommons.tv. Looking forward to all those shows. Uh, In the store at badmagicmerch.com, we have two new teas in the store. An official Space Lizard tea and a classic Secret Suck tea. Exclusives for Space Lizards. If you want one and you're not a spacer, you can sign up today on Patreon. Uh, you get uh, 20% off uh, all merch. You get 20% of your patronage going directly to monthly charities, access to Space Lizard exclusive merch like these tees, access to 240 Secret Suck episodes and counting, over 360 hours of content, ability to vote for two topics a month and more, and coming soon, finally, uh, ad-free episodes of Time Suck. I know it's been, a, it's been a long time I've been trying to get there. Finally getting the time to decide this summer to launch what I've been wanting to launch for about two years. So hail Nimrod, and uh, let's get back into the subject. So episode structure, what is it going to be this week? Well, first, I'm going to list in great detail dozens of extraterrestrial races who are most likely responsible for the disappearance of this damn plane. Uh, draconians, Umites, retic- uh, reticulants, oh my God, reticulants, Syrians, Evidemics, Evidemics, Pleiad- Pleiadians, Lyrans, Solarians, Naga reptilians, non Naga reptilians, Greens, Iguanoids, Anakims, Martians, Genosians, and you know, on and on. The, the usual, the usual suspects. So many potentially nefarious space critters scurrying about the universe. Uh, and of course, there's the hybrid species. Combinations of some of the ones I mentioned and others. Uh, the cyborgs created by some of these species. And we cannot forget the various races of hollow earth dwellers as well. Some of whom certainly spawned in a different solar system like the uh, Agarians, the Atlans, the Antarcticans, various ancient root races, the Taros people, so many others. And last but not least, there are so many other entities believed to uh, you know, live here on earth, but not in this dimension. Beings vibrating, of course, at a, at a different frequency. You get it. Right? They live in the same space in the galaxy, but a parallel dimension like the Lemurians, Ulterans, and, and many others. No, I'm not going to do that. Uh, but I did spend too much time on a few super fucking weird, uh, what remote basement in the woods was all this written on websites. In order to remind myself of what supposed alien races there are around us. And yeah, those pronunciations, some of those are, are tricky because they're completely fucking made up words. Uh, I'm truly envious of the certainty of some forms of insanity. So much nonsense presented by someone who seems to be so absolutely certain that they're spitting nothing but indisputable fact. No evidence, literally none, but still, they just, they fucking know for a fact that these are the alien races. Here's what they're up to. Uh, Being someone who is constantly living in the mental space of, I don't fucking know, 
life is so complicated. There's, there's so much we got to figure out. Uh, I think this is right. That no facts needed certainty, it just seems like a fun mental space to live in. So whoever came up with those alien websites, well, I envy you in some ways. Uh, real structure now. First, we're going to discuss some statistics about aviation and plane crashes in the U.S. and also globally. Then we'll cover several high-profile plane disappearances over the past 70 years, followed by the timeline of the disappearance of MH370 uh, and the investigation that came afterwards. Following the timeline, I'll go over a bunch of conspiracies and then share my conclusion as to what most likely happened. Uh, a conclusion others who worked a lot harder on all of this came up with. Not something I just pulled out of my ass. Uh, okay, starting with some stats. Fellow stat lovers, I do enjoy me some numbers. Now more than ever, cold, hard numbers, no emotion in numbers. And the stats they reveal, right? They're beautiful, wonderfully neutral little things. Uh, the following information comes from the Federal Aviation Administration's May 2022 edition of Air Traffic by the Numbers which sounds like one of the most fucking boring magazines of all time. But I'm glad that someone put it together or I would have had a much harder time finding some of these stats. Uh, the downloadable report only tracking flights to and from the U.S. declares every day FAA's air traffic organization provides service to more than 45,000 flights and 2.9 million airline passengers across more than 29 million square miles of airspace. The FAA handles over 16 million flights each year, approximately 16,405,000. So 45,000 average daily flights, more than 10 million scheduled passenger flights each year across 520 airport traffic control towers. In the U.S., there are 19,633 airports, which is about uh, 16,000 more than I expected. So fucking many. 5,082 public and 14,551 private. Way more, again, than I thought. Uh, some of the public airports, I guess, are just, you know, tiny little regional ones. There are more than 14,000 people working for air traffic control. Almost, again, 3 million passengers, approximately 2,900,000 passengers fly in the U.S. every day. U.S. pilots in total fly more than 25 million general aviation hours each year. So clearly in the U.S. alone, there's a massive amount of flights, passengers, and hundreds of thousands of people working and flying every day from place to place. How likely is it that any one of these flights will experience a fatal accident? As I stated in the cold open, the average American's risk of being killed in a plane crash, one in 11 million. And the risk of uh, an American dying in a car crash, one in 5,000. Uh, worldwide, between 2012 and 2016, there was only a one in 3.37 billion chance of dying in a commercial airline plane crash. So much more dangerous to drive in a car. It's not even close. And yet, while I know several people who are so afraid of flying, they will either not fly or need to be medicated to fly, I don't know anyone who just won't get into a fucking car because of anxiety. Why is that? Well, statistically, 11% of people, according to the APA, the American Psychological Association, are, quote, pussy-ass bitches. <laughs> no, no. Uh, again, circling to what I uh, touched on in the cold open, a lack of control seems to feed a fear of flying. Numerous psychologists have noted that we are less afraid of things we have control over, even if they are more dangerous. Also, awareness makes things seem riskier. Uh, when there's a, a fatal plane crash, national news outlets almost always make it a huge story, right? Just constantly showing like, you know, uh, footage of the plane crash if they have it. But every day there are thousands of fatal car crashes and they usually only make local news outlets uh, if they make it to the news at all. You know, it's that when it bleeds, it leads. Good old fear mongering has made many of us uh, irrationally afraid to fly. Additionally, the fear factor of dying an extremely painful death seems to make flying seem more risky than driving based on, uh, you know, information related to numerous sources. Even though getting mangled in a car isn't going to hurt any less than getting mangled in a plane. I don't think. I mean, I'm not a, a pain expert, but I'm 99.9% .9 sure that mangled is just fucking mangled. Doesn't matter how you slice it. Pretty positive that no one barely hanging on to life after being fucking shredded in a gnarly car accident uh, utters the following dying words. Just, at least I wasn't in a plane crash. At least my leg is only across the street and not a thousand miles away. Or, you know, whatever. And I say that realizing that while uh, all this might make you feel a bit better about flying, probably makes you feel uh, less good about driving. And I do know that many, if not most of you, drive while listening. Don't be mad at me. I'm just a messenger. And also, fucking focus. You're in a death machine right now. Uh, in seven of the past 10 years, there have actually been zero airline passenger fatalities, right, on commercial flights. 
Cannot say the same for auto fatalities. Uh, there have been at least 32,000 traffic fatalities every year in the last 10 years in just the U.S. In both 2021 and 2022, there were over 42,000 fatalities each year. And, uh, and the seven of the past 10 years were also just for the U.S. Uh, but that is an average of 115 deaths a day in the U.S. for car crashes. Uh, not counting private or military aircrafts, only one dude has died in a U.S. commercial aviation accident in the first half of 2023. And it wasn't really an accident. On June 23rd in San Antonio, Texas, a ground worker decided to end it all by throwing themselves into the left engine of an Airbus A319 operated by Delta Airlines. One source said that the uh, 34-year-old man was, quote, ingested into the engine. Ingested. That sounds fucking horrific. Uh, Last year, 11 people died nationwide. On New Year's Eve in 2022, another airline ground worker was accidentally pulled into another engine, uh, another ingestion in Montgomery, Alabama. And on September 4th, 10 people died when a DHC-3 turbine otter single engine float plane crashed near Whidbey Island, Washington in Mutiny Bay. Uh, That plane seemed to have crashed due to a mechanical failure. And that was it for 2022. uh, Over 42,000 traffic fatalities that year compared to 11 aviation fatalities. Worldwide for 2021, the most recent year I could find solid stats, 176 total people, crew and passengers combined, died in air traffic fatalities. uh, Compared again to over 42,000 automobile fatalities in just the U.S. that year. Zooming out for a uh, uh, same year comparison globally in 2019, the most recent year for which I can find data, there were approximately 1.2 million road traffic deaths, uh, deaths in- involving traffic incidents, including vehicle drivers or passengers, motorcyclists, cyclists, or pedestrians. And the same year, 289 deaths from aviation accidents. So your odds of dying in a car wreck in 2019 were roughly 4,152 times greater than dying in a plane crash. Even in 2014, taking in all the crew and passengers on board uh, Malaysia Airlines Flight 370, a total of 239 people, only 692 total people died in aviation incidents compared to 1.21 million people dying in road traffic incidents. Way safer up in the air compared to on the ground every single year. Or is it? People do generally drive more often than they fly. So, you know, if one person drove every day and another person flew every day, Who would be most likely to die first? Well, it's hard to find that exact comparison. Here's as close to an apples to apples comparison as I could find. Each time you drive, based on US 2020 auto fatality statistics, you have a one in 7,142,900 chance of dying. Whereas each time you fly, you have a one in 3,670,470 people chance of someone on your plane dying. Presented differently, on average, a person would need to take a flight every day for 10,078 years to be involved in an accident with at least one fatality that might not be you, right? Just any fatality on the plane. The last one to me is the best argument for flying being infinitely safer than driving. Also, on an anecdotal level, how many people have you known who have died in car accidents compared to plane crashes? While I know people who have known other people who've died in plane crashes, I've never known anyone directly, but I know a lot of, uh, or have known a lot of people who have died in car wrecks. And statistically, the same is true for the overwhelming majority of people listening. Few more flight stats before moving on to other flight disappearances. Why statistically do planes crash or get into accidents? Well, about half the time, uh, the the crash is caused by pilot error, uh, air traffic control error, another common reason for plane accidents. Pilots rely on the information they receive from ATC. So if ATC, air traffic control, uh, makes an error, it could easily cause a deadly accident. Inclement weather conditions like snow, wind, rain, and fog also cause accidents. Mechanical failure, responsible for about 20% of accidents. 10% of accidents caused by other factors like sabotage, poor runway maintenance, and birds. Fucking birds. Uh, Somehow, even though they're not real, they've actually caused a lot of infamous accidents. The most famous bird strike incident in recent years has to be uh, U.S. Airways Flight 1549. Pilot Tom Hanks, or Sully Sullenberger, uh, was at the controls of the Airbus 320 when it took off from New York's LaGuardia Airport January 15th, 2009, with five crew members and 150 passengers on board. The flight heading to Charlotte, North Carolina should have been a routine one, but minutes after takeoff, the plane ran directly into a flock of Canadian geese. The sometimes migratory Canadian goose is a pretty big bird up to uh, four feet in height. 
uh, weighing up to 24 pounds. One large goose hitting a plane can be dangerous, but a whole flock uh, can do enough damage uh, to really take the plane out of the air. And it did enough uh, damage to uh, hurt both engines of the huge airliner in this case. Unable to restart the engines, Captain Sully made the decision to set the plane down on the Hudson River. Less than five minutes after the strike, that cool hand Luke son of a bitch landed on the water, saving the lives of all 155 people on board. Hail Tom Hanks! I mean, hail Sully! Uh, In a less uplifting bird-related flight disaster, on October 4th, 1960, 62 of the 72 people on board Eastern Airlines Flight 375 departing from Logan International Airport in Boston uh, and headed to Philadelphia, then to Charlotte, randomly. They were killed when the flight crashed shortly after takeoff after hitting a giant flock of tiny-ass starlings. Three out of four of the engines sustained massive damage at an altitude of just 120 feet. Seconds later, the plane crashed into the bay. During the investigation, 75 starling carcasses were found on the runway. Many, uh, uh, many more were found uh, you know, uh, in the water, or were just uh, obliterated, ingested by the plane's engines. The tiny birds only weigh about three and a half ounces each, but they can fly in flocks, uh, large flocks known as murmurations, uh, as big as six million fucking birds. That's the largest ever recorded in England. Six million birds. Not that somebody counted each and every one of them. Uh, So in conclusion, you're very safe on a plane unless you see some large birds or a shit ton of little tiny birds near the plane, especially during takeoff, on a flight headed to or eventually headed to Charlotte. If you're headed to Charlotte from the East Coast and you see some birds, holy shit, you are as good as fucking dead. Unless Tom Hanks or someone Tom Hanks has portrayed is flying the plane. But seriously, as you can see, uh, flying is a very safe method of travel, which means if you're afraid to fly, you're, uh, you're absolutely the crazy person. And you should be put in a cage and studied and, and bathed with a fire hose and never let out. Or you're one of millions of people with a very common phobia. Let's now shift focus from death to mystery and take a look at some high profile plane disappearances throughout aviation history and cover some planes and pastures that completely or almost completely disappeared Uh, to date in the last 120 years of aviation history roughly 25,000 planes have inexplicably gone missing we're going to go over just a few here now Uh, when we think of planes and pastures that have gone missing one of the first people to come to mind is uh, former suck subject Amelia Earhart episode 55 if you want the whole story Uh, Here's the synopsis. In 1932, Earhart was the first woman to fly alone across the Atlantic Ocean. Then in 1937, she made it her mission to fly around the globe. She completed more than half of her trip flying a twin engine Lockheed Electra 10E. In July of 1937, Amelia and navigator Fred Noonan disappeared near Howland Island, an uninhabited coral island located just north of the equator in the central Pacific Ocean, about 1,700 nautical miles southwest of Honolulu. So not far from the international dateline. So in the, in the middle of fucking nowhere, a refueling station was set up on this little island to assist in Earhart's journey. But then her plane disappeared near that dateline in the central Pacific Ocean. The cause, the exact location of the crash, still unknown, and the remains of Amelia and Fred have never been found. The official U.S. position is that Earhart and Noonan ran out of fuel on the way to Howland Island and crashed into the Pacific. Another popular theory is that Earhart and Noonan landed their Lockheed Electra on Nicomaroro Island, a speck of land 350 nautical miles southwest of Howland when they couldn't find Howland. Uh, at the time of Earhart's disappearance, the tide on Nicomaroro uh, was especially low, revealing a reef surface along the shore that would be long and flat enough to land a plane. Some researchers theorized that the tide soon lifted the Electra off the reef not long after they landed, and then it sank or was broken up in the surf. Later in 1937, a British party exploring the island with the intent of colonizing it uh, found some stuff. Eric Bovington, a colonial officer, noticed uh, what looked like an overnight bivouac. Took a photograph of the shoreline, which included an unidentified object that some speculate was the plane's landing gear. By 1938, the island was colonized as part of the Phoenix Islands uh, settlement scheme, uh, one of the British Empire's last expansions. Colonists reported finding airplane parts or airplane parts, some of which maybe came from the Electra. In 1940, Gerald Gallagher, Jerry G, baby. I uh, love Jerry. Oh, gee, Jerry. I've never heard of this guy. Uh, but he was the uh, colonial administrator Administrator there. Uh, and he discovered 13 bones buried near the remains of a campfire. Also found the remnants of two shoes, a man's and a woman's shoe, as well as a box that once held a sextant, which is a navigation device that uh, they probably would have had. The bones were shipped to Fiji, measured, subsequently lost, 
Researchers evaluated the measurements using modern techniques, determined the bones could be from a woman of Earhart's size and build. Finally, several 1930s era glass bottles were discovered at the overnight bivouac site that Eric Bevington found. One of them might have even contained freckle cream, which was a cosmetic Earhart likely used. Did uh, Earhart and Newton land there and then starve before anyone else showed up? Possibly. Uh, If that happened, what happened to the rest of the remains outside of those 13 bones? Well, maybe some creepy-ass coconut crabs got them. Uh, These creeps are some big-ass crabs, up to just over three feet across. They can weigh nine pounds, and Nicomororo Island is fucking loaded with them. While they feed primarily on fleshy fruits, nuts, and seeds, they will also happily eat dead animals or any other organic matter uh, opportunistically. They're vulture crabs. Uh, Basically, anything left unattended on the ground that is remotely edible is a potential source for these fucking crab goats. Uh, I watched a time-lapse video of these things going buck wild on a pig carcass. It's pretty disturbing. Uh, They left almost nothing. Just a few bones. Took the rest back to their creepy little crab dungeons. And some scientists think this is what happened to Amelia and Fred. The third big theory with Earhart and Noonan is that unable or perhaps not intending for some reason to find Howland Island, they headed north to the Japanese-controlled Marshall Islands where they were taken hostage by the Japanese, possibly as U.S. spies, and then executed. Or, least likely, they returned to the U.S. under assumed names. According to one theory that goes along with this very remote, I don't buy it for a second possibility, Earhart took the name Irene Craigmile, then married a Guy Bolum and became Irene Bolum, who died in New Jersey in 1982. But why would she do that? Well, some vague national security reason is the speculation. Uh, this theory is not believed by many. Hon- honestly, it comes across as pretty crackpot to me. I mean, why would the Japanese release her? Uh, and then why wouldn't she be able to talk about that? She was beloved, right? Her, uh, her return would have been a major national morale boost during the war. Nah, I got to really put the uh, tinfoil hat uh, on tight for that one to make sense. Most believe her plane sank in waters up to 17,000 feet deep on the way to Howland Island. Just ran out of, ran out of fuel. Uh, until her plane is conclusively found, there will continue to be all kinds of theories. Uh, hard to avoid talking about the Bermuda Triangle when it comes to aircraft disappearances. Let's go there next. December 5th, 1945, Flight 19, which is the designation given to a group of five General Motors TBM Avenger Navy torpedo bombers carrying 14 crew members, randomly disappeared during a training mission. Uh, the weather was average that day when the pilots took off from a military base in Fort Lauder- Lauderdale, Florida. Uh, the pilots experienced problems with their compasses before they lost contact with the ground station. The ground station was able to track communications between the pilots, noted they were disoriented and lost. The pilots agreed that once the first plane dropped below 10 gallons of fuel, all of them would return to base, but then none of them ever came back. Uh, the Coast Guard launched an extensive search operation, covered over 400,000 miles over five days, And then one of the rescue planes with 13 passengers on board, it also disappeared. What the hell happened to all of them? Uh, The only evidence pinpointing a location for at least the rescue plane came from an ocean liner that was in the general area of the missing aircraft where a crew member claimed they saw a giant fireball in the sky. Uh, The planes, the passengers, never been found. A report by Navy investigators concluded that flight leader Lieutenant Charles C. Taylor, Chucky T, baby, uh, mistook small islands offshore for the Florida Keys after his compasses stopped working, resulting in the flight heading over open sea away from land. Uh, the report was later amended by the Navy to read cause unknown to avoid blaming Taylor for the loss of the five aircraft and 14 men. The report attributed the loss of the PPM aircraft, the rescue flight, to an explosion in midair while searching for the other planes. I think uh, the Genosians might be responsible for this one. I mean, I just my gut. According to super duper credible sources like Alienpedia.com, <laughs> probably, you know, built at Harvard or Yale or something. Uh, the Genosians come from the system of Alde- Aldebaran, a system of two pairs of binary companion stars located in the Aldebaran sector of the Beta Quadrant near the Alpha Quadrant border, uh, approximately 65.1 light years from the Sol system. And it contains at least four planets, two of which for sure have been colonized 100%. And according to my credible sources, a group of refugees left their home planet, Janos, centuries ago in a huge carrier vessel after an asteroid or meteor shower devastated the surface of their planet. And that caused a uh, a chain reaction in the nuclear power grid, uh, losing deadly radiation uh, into the atmosphere and to the underground tunnels and cities where the Genosians lived. And then that vessel reached Mars in our solar system. And there the Genosians made um, uh, some, uh, some pottery. Or something, and we're sad. 
and maybe died, but maybe not. Maybe killed by other Martians. Sources are pretty vague and filled with a lot of claims that are as boring as they are strange. Uh, and, you know, uh, they also might have made some new spaceships. Came to Earth and fucked up a couple of planes in the Bermuda Triangle in 1945. Look, you know what? It's all very confusing. Genosian sources are, for whatever reason, all over the place. When it comes to who the Genosians were, uh, who they might still be, uh, what they are doing or may have done. Which is why you can probably, you know, blame them for a lot of things like flight disappearances. Next mystery. One that was recently solved. Uh, August 2nd, 1947. A British South American Airways Lancastrian plane called Stardust disappeared over the Andes Mountains during a connecting flight from Buenos Aires to Santiago, Chile. Santiago, Chile! That felt better. Uh, just before the plane disappeared, the radio operator sent out a Morse code Morse code message, S-T-E-N-D-E-C, some Stendek. The plane seemed like it had vanished into, the, into thin air until 1998 when some climbers found plane fragments coming from a glacier. Modern investigators believe that the plane's navigator didn't know about a jet stream that could slow down planes flying west. Navigator requested to descend before they actually cleared the mountains and they crashed. In 2000, body parts of passengers were found in the glacier's ice, and they were quickly defrosted uh, and eaten, just like the bodies of the rugby players aboard Uruguayan Air Force Flight 571 that crashed in 1972. I still think about that old fight song from episode 302 sometimes. Conga, 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 the plane is dancing conga. Some guy just flew out the wing and broke off, and, but we're still going to crush old Gregorian. Let's fucking go. Uh, everyone who crashes in the Andes gets eaten. It's custom. It's tradition. No, uh, no one is sure exactly what the message Stendek means. Some think it uh, was based on some World War II code for severe turbulence encountered, now descending, emergency crash landing. And uh, yeah, and of course, no one was eaten. Uh, they did find pretty well-preserved remains of people 53 years after they died, though, which had to have been trippy. Uh, also, in the last 120 years of aviation history, uh, roughly 25,000 planes did not inexplicably uh, go missing. That was crazy talk. I should have corrected that earlier. I almost forgot to correct that. That's way too many. Uh, no, since 1948, between a 80 and 100 aircraft, depending on the source, have gone missing in flight and never been recovered. Still quite a few. Uh, let's go over just a couple more. On January 17th, 1949, British South American Airways Star Aerial was flying from Bermuda to Jamaica. An hour after departure, the Star Aerial communicated its location to the ground station. The plane then completely disappeared at an altitude of 18,000 feet. A rescue team didn't start searching until more than seven hours later. By then, the plane could have sunk to the ocean floor. Excuse me. Investigators ruled out three causes of the crash. Uh, lack of fuel, pilot error, and poor weather. British investigators concluded some external cause may have overwhelmed both man and machine. The fuck does that mean? Uh, officially, no one has any idea what happened to this flight. The wreckage of the plane, nor the bodies of the 20 people on board, have ever been found. And that one sounds like, uh, that one sounds like reticulants to me, a.k.a. the Greys, a.k.a. the Zeta reticulants, a.k.a. the Roswell Greys, a.k.a. I wish I was making this shit up. These motherfuckers are frequent subjects of close encounters and alien abduction claims. They will abduct anyone. They're shady shit. Facts. Uh, originating from the Zeta reticuli, reticuli star system, according to people who are really good at blending science and science fiction, these are the aliens who seem to be doing the most anal probing of their captives. So I have to say the majority of people who have vanished in flight disappearances uh, probably either already died uh, from a lot of anal probing or are being anally probed right now on some kind of spaceship. Next mystery. March 10th, 1956. Three Air Force officers and the B-47 Stratajet they were flying in were lost in the Mediterranean Sea. This uh, B-47 was carrying two nuclear weapon cores on board. No one knows what happened to the plane, the crew, or the nuclear bombs. This is one of several Broken Arrow incidents in U.S. history. Uh, broken Arrow is any incident in which a nuclear weapon is lost, stolen, or inadvertently detonated. And the U.S. government claims that there have been 32 Broken Arrow incidents since 1950. That seems like a lot. 32 incidents uh, in which nukes have been lost, stolen, or accidentally <laughs> have exploded. Uh, the Department of Defense wrote about the missing plane and its nukes in narrative summaries of accidents involving U.S. nuclear weapons, 1950 to 1980. They said the aircraft was one of a flight of four scheduled for nonstop deployment from McDill Air Force Base to an overseas air base. Takeoff from McDill and first refueling were normal. The second refueling point was over the Mediterranean Sea. In preparation for this, the flight penetrated solid cloud formation to descend to the refueling level at 14,000 feet. 
Base of the clouds was 14,500 feet and visibility was poor. The aircraft carrying two nuclear capsules and carrying cases never made contact with the tanker. An extensive search failed to locate any traces of the missing aircraft or crew. No weapons were aboard the aircraft, only two capsules of nuclear weapons, material and carrying cases. So I guess, you know, when I said bomb, it, wasn't, it was like stuff that could make a bomb. Uh, nuclear detonation was not possible, it said. Uh, on board were Captain Robert H. Hodgen, Bobby H., uh, Captain Gordon M. Inslee, Gordy I., doesn't really work, uh, Second Lieutenant, and Ronald L. Kurtz, Ronnie K., that one place. A French news outlet reported that some witnesses claimed that they saw the plane explode in the air over the skies of French Morocco near its last known position, but the remains of the plane and its passengers never been found. So maybe they saw it explode. Or maybe the reticulans wanted to do some experiments on buttholes that had spent a lot of time next to some nuke juice. Maybe you weren't there. It's hard to say. Next mystery, March 16th, 1962, U.S. Army Flying Tiger Flight 739 failed to arrive at its destination in the Philippines. The aircraft chartered by the U.S. Army was transporting 96 military passengers. Man, that's a lot. Uh, the plane went missing in the Philippine Sea over the uh, Mariana Trench, a.k.a. the Marinera Spaghetti Pasta Bolores Antonio Banderas Trench. Uh, the flight crew's final radio transmission did not indicate that they were experiencing any trouble. One hour after the plane's final communication, members of a standard oil tanker saw a luminous explosion in the sky, which investigators believe was the plane. The plane made no distress calls, which makes it difficult to know exactly when the plane crashed. Seems to have uh, happened pretty quick. There were claims that the plane was shot down by the U.S. government, but there's literally no known evidence supporting those claims. Uh, others believe that the plane's engine failed. Uh, the most likely theory seems to be that the plane exploded and its wreckage sunk to the bottom of the sea. A few crewmen aboard a Liberian tanker did say they uh, saw fireballs descend from the sky into the water near what would have been its route the night the plane disappeared. However, people familiar with the construction of this model of aircraft don't seem to think that is possible. They don't think it's possible the plane would just blow up in the middle of a normal operation. So maybe struck by a meteorite. Maybe aliens wanted 96 more butts to examine. We don't know. Rescuers searched 114,000 square miles of ocean, failed to find the plane or any of the 107 passengers on board. No one knows why the plane crashed for sure or where it went. One more before we jump into the mystery of MH370. July 26, or I'm sorry, uh, July 22nd, 2016, India began a search and rescue operation for an Indian Air Force plane that went missing. The plane was an IAF AN-32 transport plane. The plane went missing after taking off from the city of Chennai. The plane was on a routine cur uh, courier service route to Port Blair, capital of the Adaman and Nicobar Islands. The plane took off at 8.30 a.m. for the three-hour flight, made final contact 50 minutes after takeoff from um, Tamburin Air Force Station in Chennai. 42 minutes later, the plane went left, descended from 23,000 feet, and then vanished off the radar. Defense Minister uh, Manor Parikar told the Indian Parliament, there is no SOS, no transmission on any frequency. It just disappeared. A few minutes before the plane went off the radar, the pilot said he was heading right to avoid a rain cloud. The plane was just 8 to 10 minutes from reaching the limits of radar coverage in the region. Uh, that vanished before reaching uh, coverage. Five surveillance aircraft and uh, 13 Navy and Coast Guard ships quickly began a search. The plane had two emergency locator transmitters, but no underwater locator system. The missing plane had flown this particular route three times a week for several years. The pilot in control that day logged 500 hours on that specific route. The plane's equipment had recently been upgraded. It had flown 270 hours with the upgraded equipment. The plane did have three technical issues in the weeks before the crash. Nothing major at all. But now technical failure is the leading theory regarding why it disappeared. On September 15th, 2016, the IAF ended their search for this plane, uh, wrote to the families of the 29 people on board that they could not locate the plane and therefore the people on board were presumed dead. I blame the Draconians for this one, aka the reptilian elite, space lizards, Anunnaki, Anunnaki. They need to keep humanity afraid to live, right? That's what all my very credible sources claim. They literally eat our fear. And what keeps us afraid? Horror stories involving clowns. Stephen King is for sure reptilian. What also keeps us afraid, though? Any movie directed by James Wan, another reptilian. But what also keeps us afraid? Flight disappearances. Okay, now, uh, I'm going to talk about aliens less. <laughs> and let's begin the timeline of the disappearance of Malaysia Airlines Flight MH370. One of many flights that have vanished over the years, but not you know, one of 25,000. And we'll also dive into the lengthy search and investigation that followed his disappearance. 
Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time-suck timeline. March 8, 2014. Malaysia Airlines Flight 370, MH370, departs from the Kuala Lumpur International Airport with 239 people on board. Uh, Kuala Lumpur, one of the fastest growing cities in the world, uh, the largest city in Malaysia, while the city itself has only almost exactly 2 million people, uh, the metro area home to over 7.5 million people. It's the cultural, financial, and economic center of Malaysia, and it didn't even exist 200 years ago. First sprang up in 1857 to service tin miners who had flooded the area. Now a very modern, very beautiful city, a popular travel destination for tourists, very popular, sixth most visited city in the world as recently as 2019. Malaysia Airlines, founded in 1972 after the company split from Malaysia Singapore Airlines, founded in 1947. It is the nation's flagship airline. The company is based in the Kuala Lumpur International Airport. The airline flies in Eastern and Southeastern Asia, Australia, New Zealand, the Middle East, Europe, and flew from Tokyo to Los Angeles until April of 2014. Malaysia Airlines currently owns and operates more than 100 planes, and overall, it is a very safe airline. The Aviation Safety Network reported only five incidents prior to the MH370 disappearance. On the evening of December 4th, 1977, the first incident, uh, Malaysia Airline Flight 653 from Penang to Kuala Lumpur was hijacked. All 93 passengers and seven crew members died when the plane crashed onto Malaysian soil. Uh, Hit the ground at a near vertical angle, very high speed, and was basically just obliterated. Uh, Sadly, the circumstances in which the hijacking and subsequent crash occurred remain unsolved. December 18th, 1983, Malaysia Airline Flight 684 landed short of the runway at Subang or Subang, excuse me, International Airport. The plane was badly damaged, but no one died. Uh, No one was even seriously injured. September 2nd, 1992, a plane's tires and left main gear collapsed. That plane went off the runway at uh, Cebu Airport in Malaysia. Uh, No one on board injured. September 15th, 1995, something more serious happened. Malaysia Airlines Flight 2133 landed 500 meters from the end of a 2,220-meter runway in Kota, uh, Kinabalu. Not good, really not good. The pilot, Captain Wong Kang Lok, attempted to take off and try a second landing but was not successful. Pilot error led to the plane crashing into houses near the airport and 34 people on board died. 40 houses and this uh, shanty town at the end of the runway damaged in the crash. It uh, doesn't seem anyone living on the edge of the runway died, but 10 people living there were injured. Why did the captain of the plane attempt that landing? Well, it sounds like he was a disgruntled employee. He'd been marked for mistakes in the past, uh, claimed to colleagues that someone in the company was out to get him. It's thought that he was worried that if he didn't land, he'd be blamed for wasting fuel that it would take for a second attempt and for the flight being late. And that's why he uh, tried to land when he didn't have enough runway. Uh, finally, the fifth incident doesn't have anything to do with flying, actually. On March 15th, 2000, 30 different baggage handlers were ingested into the same engine in the craziest baggage handling tragedy ever. It's thought that the first handler was sucked into the engine, ingested on accident, and then one after another, it's believed his coworkers followed him into the engine, either trying to save whoever was just ingested in front of them, or they just thought that was like a new part of the job that no one had talked to them about before. And that's fucking, that's, of course, that's nonsense. That'd be a crazy thing to witness. No, uh, March 15th, 2000, a few baggage handlers who were unloading 80 canisters off a large Airbus, were overcome by strong toxic fumes. The canisters contained oxalyl chloride, a toxic chemical. The canisters had leaked, damaged the aircraft beyond repair. A Chinese company was fined $65 million for mislabeling the canisters and damages, and luckily, no one died. Uh, The disappearance of MH370 will be the sixth incident, and obviously the biggest, up until later that same year. Uh, More on that towards the end of the episode. 2014, a rough fucking year for Malaysia Airlines. MH370 was a Boeing 777-2H6ER. Plane's registration number 9M-MRO. H6 is the Boeing designation for Malaysia Airlines. ER means extended range. The plane was the 404th Boeing 777 ever produced. Uh, According to the Aviation Safety Network, the plane took its first flight May 14th, 2002. It had flown 53,465 hours on 7,525 flight cycles, one takeoff and one landing. The Boeing 777 designed to carry 282 passengers, about 35 in business class, 247 in economy. The Boeing 777 has a max fuel capacity of more than 47,000 gallons. 
That's so many gallons. And a range of 7,941 miles. Just a tick under 8,000. Man, that is a, that is a long ways. Uh, the, the longest uh, commercial flight I could find, the Airbus A350-900 ULR, it can fly over 11,000 miles before it needs to refuel. Man, advancements in technology. We have come so far with flights. Uh, the first commercial flight back in 1914 between St. Petersburg and Tampa, Florida, flew 14 miles. Uh, that plane, a Benoit 14, carried one passenger, <laughs> and it could not fly more than 125 miles or faster than 64 miles an hour. Cruising speed of the MH370 variant of the Boeing 777 was about 640 miles per hour. So, you know, just a, a wee bit faster, just like 10 times faster. The plane had its last maintenance. Well, that's cruising speed, so it's more than 10 times faster. But the plane had its last maintenance on February 23rd, 2014. So just two weeks before it disappeared and no issues found during maintenance. Uh, however, the report written on the one-year anniversary of the disappearance revealed that the battery from one of the black box locator beacons did expire a year before the plane went missing. So the maintenance check didn't catch, you know, absolutely everything. Uh, because the battery for one of the locator beacons was expired, even if search crews got close to the battery, they might not have gotten a signal. Uh, black box batteries normally required to last 30 days after a crash. The report states that an error in maintenance records was why the battery was not replaced. The flight data recorder would have kept logging data, though, even if the locator beacon battery was dead. And the other black box battery was up to date. So search crews would have seen its pings if they were near it. So in the end, this one beacon being down probably didn't affect the search literally at all. Uh, the plane had never had any major incidents yet before the disappearance, but it was involved in a minor ground collision in 2012 that significantly damaged a wingtip. In August of 2012, the plane's wingtip collided with the tail of a China Eastern Airlines Airbus while taxiing in Shanghai. The Aviation Safety Network reported that the 777 wingtip broke off and it wasn't a problem though. They, uh, they got some uh, Gorilla Glue and they fucking duct tape. And they put it back on and it seemed to be working great. Uh, no, it was replaced. Uh, even if the wingtip was badly damaged when the plane was lost, it wouldn't explain what happened to it though. Not at all. So the plane was solid mechanically. Nothing suspicious as far as it not being built well or, or anything or having like maintenance issues. So who was on board March 8th, 2014? 227 passengers, 12 crew members. All of the crew were Malaysian. The pilots flying that day were 53-year-old Captain Zahari Armad Shah or Ahmad Shah, and 27-year-old First Officer uh, Farik Abdul Hamid. Captain Zahari was born in the state of Penang, Malaysia. He was an experienced pilot with over 18,000 hours of flight time. He was married with three adult children, lived in a gated community, owned two houses, one of which had an at-home flight simulator in it that he used often and posted about uh, this flight simulator in online forums. Uh, he was also a blogger. He ran a blog called I Hate My Life and Can't Fucking Wait to Kill As Many Pastors As Possible Because All They Do Is Bitch, Bitch, Bitch and My Coworkers Are Cunts. Wasn't very popular, uh, maybe because the blog's title was too long. Investigators have decided that since he ended all of his very hateful, very violent blog posts with, just kidding, uh, the blog doesn't have any connection to his last flight. Uh, no, <laughs> no, he's not a blogger, of course. Uh, he was a very successful pilot in a nation where that is apparently even a bigger deal than it is here in the U.S. It's a prestigious well-paid profession. He was respected, long-time senior pilot. First officer Farrick uh, had 2,763 flight hours on under his belt. He was engaged, planning the wedding at the time of his disappearance, seemed to have everything going for him. Back to Captain Zahari. Uh, while he was one of the most senior pilots working for Malaysia Airlines, first officer Farrick Hamid was the one actually flying the plane that day, uh, part of his training, supposed to be his last training flight, sadly, before he became fully certified. Captain Zahari uh, was working the radios. Uh, yeah, and again, there were 227 passengers on board. 153 of them were Chinese. Three passengers were American. Six were Australian. Two were Canadian. Four were from France. One passenger was from Hong Kong. Five passengers were Indian. Seven were Indonesian. Two were Iranian. One was from the Netherlands. One was Russian. One was uh, Taiwanese. Two were from the Ukraine. And one passenger was a prominent member of Al-Qaeda who legally changed his name to death to those who dishonor the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, he was able to bring an AK-47 on board, which he was only allowed to do because he pinky swore it wasn't loaded. I'll stop. I'll stop for at least a little bit. Uh, of course, that last guy's made up. Uh, five passengers failed to show up for the flight that evening. And imagine being one of them. Imagine being like stuck in traffic. You missed this flight. You're so pissed. And then you uh, hear on the news the next day uh, what happened that is missing. And you're the happiest you've ever been. I mean, obviously sad for people on board, but man, talk about fucking dodging a bullet. 
Uh, to give a little taste of uh, who some of the people who did board were, here's a few brief bios. Dr. Yu Chen Li, Huey L, uh, had uh, recently earned a doctoral engineering degree from Cambridge University, had just landed a job in Beijing, also a newlywed, his wife not on the flight. Uh, how tragic. Dude was just beginning to enter the prime of his life, about to reap the benefits of, I don't know, tens of thousands of hours of studies over the course of his childhood and young adulthood. Uh, Muktesh, Mukherjee, and Bai Siamo were a married couple flying to Beijing after a vacation in Vietnam. Ah, they had two young kids waiting for them. So, man, so much tragedy. Uh, Mukherjee's grandfather also had died in a tragic plane crash in the 1970s. Norli Akmar Hamid and Razan uh, Zamani were married in 2012. We're just now going on their honeymoon in Beijing. This was reportedly their first time on a plane. First time. Uh, American citizen Philip Wood, a 50-year-old IBM executive, had recently been transferred to Malaysia. Excited for a fresh start, this was his last trip to Beijing before starting his new job in Kuala Lumpur. Engineer Paul Weeks from New Zealand, also on his way to a new job, decided to leave his wedding ring and watch with his wife in case something happened to him. 20 employees from the U.S. tech company Freescale Semiconductor were on board the plane. That company currently employs about 17,000 people. Uh, these pastors will feed at least one conspiracy narrative that we will discuss later. 23-year-old Wang Moheng was one of the youngest passengers. He was with his mother, father, and two grandparents. So much of one family just wiped out in this crash. Two-year-old Yan Zhang and four-year-old Nicole Meng were the other two American citizens on board. Their mom, 36-year-old Yan Zhang, was pregnant and traveling with her husband and in-laws. Another fucking family just, just gutted. Uh, the plane took off from Kuala Lumpur International Airport, 12.41 a.m., scheduled to land in Beijing at the Beijing Capital International Airport, 6.30 a.m. Uh, there's no time difference between where the flight left in Malaysia and where it was due to land in China. Uh, the red eye should have been in the air for five hours and 34 minutes. At 1.01 a.m., the plane reached its desired cruising altitude of 35,000 feet. So far, so good. Just six minutes later, 1.07 a.m., the plane's communication system sends out its last transmission. According to the Malaysian Ministry of Transport, it showed nothing unusual. The 107 a.m. transmission showed a normal routing all the way to Beijing. MH370 had a computer on board called an Aircraft Communications Addressing and Reporting System, ACARS. ACARS collects information about the plane and pilot performance. It's uh, similar to computers and cars that track oil levels and engine performance. ACARS measures data and sends it to the airline, engine manufacturer, and other parties via satellite. 1.19 a.m. Captain Zahari checked in with air traffic control as the plane left Malaysian airspace and entered Vietnamese airspace. A communication signal to transition. An agent at the Kuala Lumpur Center said to the pilots, Malaysia 370, contact Ho Chi Minh 120.9. Good night. And Zahari responded from the cockpit, Good night, Malaysia 370. The voice on the radio did not read back the frequency like he was supposed to, but other than that, the communication was normal. Uh, how often that frequency is not read back is, is unclear. It doesn't seem like anyone has inferred anything too nefarious from this omission, but I think still somewhat of an important uh, detail to note since it came from Zahari. We'll be talking about him a lot later on. Uh, good night is a phrase used by pilots when moving from one airspace to another. Five seconds after crossing into Vietnam, the symbol representing the plane's transponder drops off the Malaysian air traffic control screens. 37 seconds later, the airplane disappears from secondary radar, the more detailed radar used by ATC that shows a plane's identifying information transmitted by the transponder. The controller in Malaysia does not notice this at the moment. By the time he does notice, he assumed the plane was just out of range in uh, near Ho Chi Minh. And this is when things start to go off the rails. Uh, at almost exactly 40 minutes into a five-hour, 34-minute flight, things stop going according to plan. At 1.21 a.m., the plane's transponder stops communicating. The transponder is what sends electronic messages to radar systems regarding the plane's flight number, altitude, speed, and heading. This is all obviously very useful information for air traffic control. ATC normally views so-called little blips on their screens, blips built on data being emitted from the transponder. When that blip goes away, according to a British journalist, news anchor, and one-time CNN aviation and airline correspondent, Richard Dick Quest. Uh huh. Now the plane is flying blind from the ground's point of view. If there is a radar there, excuse me, if there's radar there, the radar will see a blip, but they won't know who it is. 
where they are going. They will just know it's there. And before continuing, can we take a moment to respect someone literally named Dick Quest choosing to walk away from an obvious destiny as a male porn star and instead pursuing the much less sexy profession of aviation and airline correspondence. Also, this is ridiculous. <laughs> Six years before MH370 disappears, Dick Quest uh, got into a big scandal, was arrested in New York City's Central Park at 3.40 in the morning. He was picked up with a bunch of meth in his pocket, a rope around his neck that was tied to his cock and balls, and a sex toy in his boot. Fucking meth! Uh, you combine meth with a name like Dick Quest, and that's the kind of story you get. Hail Lucifina, holy shit, what a night. <laughs> and hail Nimrod. I want to thank the universe for inserting a hard partying man named Dick Quest into this story. So grateful. And I'm not kidding about any of that. Uh, of course, that story would be connected to a man named Dick Quest. Destiny, such a powerful force. Uh, anyway, back to this flight. I just, I couldn't walk past that. Uh, someone in the cockpit can use a switch to manually turn off the transponder. ATC does notice when this happens and it can cause alarm because, you know, the plane that they are monitoring uh, disappears in a sense. So did one of the pilots or perhaps someone else who had gotten into the cockpit somehow turn off the transponder or did a malfunction? The likely answer is that one of the pilots turned it off because the cockpit, so many years after 9-11, with all the enhanced security features that came in the wake of that, would have been uh, damn near impossible to either break into or sneak into. Uh, would the other pilot notice if it was turned off? Very likely that they would. Were both pilots working together to turn it off? Or did one pilot leave the cockpit, perhaps ask to check on something, and then the other turned it off? Uh, that exact scenario has been discussed quite a bit as a strong possibility of what could have happened. Uh, very, very unlikely that uh, just a mechanical failure caused it to stop uh, working. Vietnamese ATC now sees that the plane has entered their airspace and then disappears. Vietnam had an agreement in which they were supposed to inform Kuala Lumpur, excuse me, if a plane that was scheduled to enter the airspace uh, was more than five minutes late checking in. Vietnam makes repeated attempts to contact MH370 and the plane does not answer. After 18 minutes of trying to contact the flight, Vietnamese ATC calls Kuala Lumpur. Once Malaysian ATC is notified of the flight's refusal to reply or inability to do so, Kuala Lumpur Aeronautical Rescue Coordination Center should have been notified within the, uh, the hour, but for reasons never made clear, possibly, if not probably, just human error, that does not happen. The emergency response will not begin for over five hours, not until 6.32 a.m. Backing up to 1.22 a.m., MH370 disappears from Thai military radar now. Six minutes later, 1.28 a.m., a Thai radar station in southern uh, Surat Thani province uh, picked up an unknown aircraft. Can't be sure that this plane was MH370, but many who've studied this case extensively, studied it for years, think that this plane was for sure MH370. Curiously, this plane was flying in the opposite direction of MH370's intended flight path. From 121 to 128 a.m., this plane changes course again, zigzagging all over the place. 1.30 a.m., Malaysian air traffic in Subang, outside Kuala Lumpur, loses radar, radar contact with the flight strongly assumed to be MH370 as it flies over the Gulf of Thailand now, between Malaysia and Vietnam. At 1.30 a.m., Malaysian military and civilian radar starts tracking the plane as it turns around and flies southwest over the Malay Peninsula and then northwest over the Strait of Malacca fucking going all over the place. Even though the transponder on MH370 has been down for 16 minutes, ACARS was scheduled to send another transmission a half hour after its last communication, meaning it was scheduled to send a transmission at 1.37 a.m. And now that doesn't happen. And that's important information because according to Dick Quest, uh, turning off ACARS takes know-how. You know what else takes know-how? Not seriously injuring yourself while running around Central Park at nearly four in the morning with your dick literally tied to your neck. And some kind of sex toy stuck in your boot while you're fucked up on meth. <laughs> Sorry, Dick. Uh, so now two important communication devices have either malfunctioned or much more likely been turned off by someone or someone's, but likely one person on board the flight. Likely one of the pilots. However, even if the plane is not transmitting information via ACARS or the transponder, ground radar can still detect the plane and, uh, and will. 1.52 a.m. now, based on radar detection. The plane passes south of Malaysia's Penang Island, makes a right turn now, goes northwest up to uh, the Strait of Malacca that runs between the Indonesian island of Sumatra, Malaysia, and uh, South Thailand. When the plane makes the turn, First Officer Ferrick's phone pings off a tower below, but no content is transmitted. 11 minutes later, Malaysia Airlines dispatcher texts the pilots to contact Ho Chi Minh ATC, but the pilots do not answer the text. 
2.15 a.m., the Malaysian military now detects an unidentified object traveling west on their radar. This information doesn't come out until about a week later, and the unidentified object is thought to be MH370, of course. Malaysian and uh, civilian military radar tracked the plane as it flew over the island of uh, Pulau, Perak, in the Strait of Malacca. Military radar follows the plane flying west over the Malay Peninsula, and then the plane disappears from military radar about 200 miles off the coast of the state of Penang, Malaysia. This marks the last time that civilian or military radar will be able to track the aircraft. The plane is now hundreds of miles off course on the other side of the Malay Peninsula going in the wrong direction. 2.22 a.m. MH370 uh, you know, is, is the time that it leaves being tracked by radar. Uh, last radar blip shows the plane 230 miles northwest of Penang heading northwest towards the uh, Adaman Sea. 2.25 a.m. The airplane's satellite box sends out a signal. When ACARS was disabled, the satellite equipment it uses was not. Uh, it could still send and respond to satellites, little pings, a.k.a. like uh, digital handshakes, that proved, if nothing else, that the plane was at least just in the air. And at 2.25 a.m., the satellite box sends a logon request to Inmarsat, a type of satellite. The ground station responds, and the, final, uh, and the first of a final series of shakes occurs that will let investigators know how long the plane was still in the air. And kind of roughly in a vague way where it was in the air. Two important values, BTO and BFO, were recorded. I'll explain what those acronyms mean later, uh, which established the first so-called ARC, later used to track the plane's final location. More on that later as well. Uh, dispatcher now called the plane and the satellite box, accepted the link, but no one answers the call. Plane then turns south, uh, referred to in coverage of the investigation into the disappearance as the final major turn. Exact location of this turn is uh, not known. In theory, Indonesian air defense radar should have been able to discover this exact location, but their radar was turned off for the night, which is only added to the mystery, uh, as this, in theory, was not supposed to be the case. Many people believe the uh, plane was most likely on autopilot now by this point, and that whoever was flying was uh, still alive, though. We'll get into why uh, this is thought a bit later as well. Just don't want to deviate from the timeline too much at this moment. 50 minutes later, Malaysia Airlines officials are informed at 2.40 a.m. that MH370 has gone missing from radar. From 2.40 to 3.45 a.m., Malaysia Airlines now sources every communication attempt possible to locate MH370's whereabouts before declaring that it has officially lost contact with the aircraft. During this period of uncertainty, Malaysia Airlines contacts other nations' air traffic controllers and aircraft flying around the same route to make sure no one else has seen or contacted them in the past few hours. 3.45 a.m., three hours, four minutes after uh, MH370 took flight, Malaysia Airlines issues a code red alert. Code red declares a crisis that requires an immediate emergency response. Malaysia Airlines stated that they took an hour to issue the code red because they had been attempting to locate the plane and confirm it was, you know, actually missing. And for the next several hours, no one sees or hears a damn thing. 6.40 a.m., MH370 was supposed to be landing in Beijing. Now when it doesn't show up, you know, many of the friends and families of the passengers becoming aware that something has gone horribly wrong. Those po poor bastards. 44 minutes later, 7.24 a.m., Malaysia Airlines announces the disappearance of MH370 on Facebook. Uh, still, no one has a clue where the plane is. But then, although the airlines won't be made immediately aware of this, contact is made, right? Some satellite contact again. At 8.11 a.m., 8.11, March 8th, 2014, an Inmarsat satellite over the Indian Ocean is pinged by the plane for the last time. There were seven brief pings in total. This is the last one. Uh, the last was the flight's final proof of not having crashed yet. It's still in the air seven hours uh, and uh, almost seven and a half hours after taking off. It has, uh, it's, it has to be getting low on fuel now, but still in the air. Inter uh, and Inmarsat is a commercial satellite vendor in London, if I didn't say that already. Uh, Dick Quest later told CNN, he probably has the best dick name yet, right? Like, like combined with the arrest report. I mean, he truly went on a literal dick quest in the park that night. Just wandering to the park, looking for someone to share some meth with. And maybe give some, uh, some tugs on that uh, dick rope. Anyway, Quest told CNN that the satellite attempted handshakes or electronic connections with the plane, uh, but that they were incomplete. Complete enough to know that the plane was still in the air, but because of... Because the communication systems were turned off, not complete enough to confirm a precise location. Malaysian Prime Minister Najib uh, Razak soon said in his announcement about the missing flight, Due to the type of satellite data, we are unable to confirm the precise location of the plane when it last made contact with the satellite. 
Uh, Najib, by the way, is currently in prison at the age of 69. He was the Malaysian prime minister from April of 2009 to May of 2018. And then in 2020, convicted of a corruption, uh, corruption charges and a massive embezzlement and money laundering scandal. Dude illegally had over 700 million U.S. dollars funneled into his bank accounts. And while he was never charged in her death, Tommy Thomas, yes, both his first and last names are fucking Thomas, uh, the Malaysian Attorney General from 2018 to 2020, wrote that there, were, that there was evidence, excuse me, that Najib had a Mongolian model killed in 2006, executed by a bodyguard. Who the fuck names her kid uh, Thomas if their last name is Thomas? Um, Najib is currently serving a 12-year prison sentence in Kajang Prison, and uh, he, he will be brought up on more corruption charges likely in the near future. Uh, this dude being corrupt as fuck has definitely added to the mystery of the disappearance of MH370 since the Malaysian government's investigation has been criticized heavily for essentially just not doing a, a very good job. And he's exactly the kind of dude who would hide something shady. March 9th, 2014, the day after this flight was supposed to land in Beijing, the official search and rescue mission begins. Malaysian search crews focus on the Gulf of Thailand initially. An oil slick was seen near the plane's last confirmed location, but lab testing revealed quickly that the oil came from a ship and not a plane. March 10th, the search expands into the South China Sea after possible plane debris is spotted near Hong Kong. Vietnamese searchers uh, do not find anything in the water. Uh, news now comes out that uh, two of the passengers used stolen passports to board the plane, leading to theories that uh, you know go uh, somewhat viral online that the plane was hijacked as part of a terrorist operation. The first searches are concentrated on the South China Sea, but when investigators determined that MH370 turned west after the trans transponder was switched off, search teams moved to the Strait of Malacca and the uh, Andaman Sea. I th hopefully I said that right earlier, but Andaman Sea. On March 11th, investigators look into the two passengers with stolen passports, don't find connections to any terrorist groups. Also on the 11th, Malaysian officials report to a local paper that their military radar suggested that the plane turned around mid-flight. Next day, March 12th, investigators officially began looking into the possibility that the plane was hijacked or sabotaged. China released the satellite images of potential debris floating between the South China Sea and the Gulf of Thailand. Search area is expanded again. The Malaysian government will later say that the satellite images were not of MH370, though. March 14th, 2014, individuals familiar with the investigation informed the New York Times that the plane lost significant altitude after losing contact with ATC. Intelligence officials start looking into the possibility that one of the pilots or crew members had something to do with the disappearance. March 15th, the Inmarsat satellite contact is disclosed. Investigators could not pinpoint the plane's precise location, but found, you know, two arcs from the info. One arc went south from Java into the Indian Ocean, southwest of Australia. The other arc went north across Asia from Vietnam to uh, Turkmenistan. Search efforts are expanded to the Indian Ocean, southwest of Australia, and Southeast Asia, Western China, uh, the Indian subcontinent, and Central Asia. So now they're kind of looking fucking almost everywhere on Earth. I mean, th this plane might be deep in the ocean in an area covering a couple million square miles, or maybe could be crashed into the mountains somewhere in Western Asia, or in the desert, or in the jungle of East Africa, maybe somewhere in Antarctica. Uh, I'm exaggerating, but not by much. Like this, this is beyond a needle in a haystack situation. This is a needle in a field full of hundreds of haystacks situation. Uh, let's talk about the best clue for the disappearance now, those seven satellite partial links. Because the plane linked up with the satellite, that meant it was still at a high speed, high altitude cruising flight. And while connections never provided exact locations, what they did provide were two important values, burst timing offset and burst frequency offset. Those are those acronyms, BTO and BFO from earlier. Uh, burst timing offset records, uh, the, or excuse me, burst timing offset records the plane's distance from the satellite. It won't get a specific location, but can get a roughly circular set of possibilities called arcs. So that's where those arcs come from. The most important arc was the seventh one, which MH370 crossed at 8.19 a.m., Kuala Lumpur time. Calculations suggest that the plane went up towards uh, Kazakhstan, uh, Kazakhstan, if it turned north, and way out in the southern Indian Ocean if it turned south, because this weird arc reading. Uh, that's a distance of over 4,000 miles. Experts are almost positive the plane turned south because of the burst frequency offset, which includes a measure of radio frequency Doppler shifts associated with high-speed movement in relation to a satellite position. 
So now maybe there's only like a, a half field of haystacks to find the needle in. Investigators were able to figure out with this data that MH370 flew straight and fast and ended up somewhere within 500 miles of some point along the final arc. But it's a big ass arc. Uh, using where they think the flight's last flight path intersected this arc. And based on how much fuel it would have uh, had when it got there, the investigators determined that the plane most likely ran out of fuel shortly before its final ping, uh, which caused engine failure until an emergency generator kicked in. But search parties still don't know how far the plane traveled after the final ping, also don't know if someone was controlling the plane or not. Researchers decide that a 777 with no fuel would crash within 20 nautical miles of a ping, and then they add in another 20 miles to account for error, and they come up with a 40-mile stretch on either side of this fucking long-ass arc. MRSAT technicians are now able to determine that the plane turned south at 2.40 a.m., both north and west of Sumatra, and they assume that the plane now flew straight and level towards Antarctica, Antarctica, and after six hours, the plane began a steep descent. Within a few minutes of crossing the seventh arc, the plane went into the ocean, possibly breaking apart before impact. Within the first week of the disappearance, the Wall Street Journal publishes a report about these satellite transmissions, reporting that the plane flew for several hours before disappearing. Malaysia, the government eventually admits that this did happen, but still in mid-March, they withheld that info for unknown reasons, which will fuel speculation that the Malaysian government, again, super corrupt this time, does not want the plane to be found for reasons still totally unknown. Maybe unknown because they had nothing to hide other than being embarrassed over not leading the search mission very well, or maybe hiding something nefarious. Because Malaysian officials didn't accept the satellite information faster, search efforts focused on the wrong area, the South China Sea, for several days. Also on the 15th, the Malaysian government announces that they have searched the home of one of the pilots. Prime Minister Razak said that there was a possibility that the plane communication systems were deliberately disabled and the flight was taken off course intentionally. March 16th now, the search operation shifts focus solely to the Indian Ocean. March 17th, Indonesia and Australia assist in the search. Malaysian law enforcement now begins looking into all passengers, all crew, ground staff present on March 8th. Prime Minister Razak requests that Australia lead the search operation. March 18th, reports come out that Thai military radar might have detected MH370, but that info is not given to Malaysia or requested by Malaysia until this date. So yeah, it wasn't given. Uh, March 19th, the FBI joins the investigation by analyzing data from Captain Zahari's home flight simulator. The Malaysian defense minister later confirms that certain files were deleted from the flight simulator program on February 3rd. So why? Was he hiding something? or just freeing up hard drive space or getting rid of the files for some similar, not nefarious technical reason. Also on this date, experts analyzed the plane's fuel reserves and narrowed the search area to a smaller but still gigantic region of the Indian Ocean. March 20th, British journalist, news anchor, and aviation expert Dick Quest officially joins the investigation. He wants to know if airport security caught any of the final crew or passengers of MH370 trying to walk into the airport with ropes around their neck and dick and balls and a sex toy in their boot while high as fuck on meth. Malaysian uh, airport authorities in Kuala Lumpur assure him that no one showed up at the airport that day with any of that. Dick Quest refuses to believe them, spends the following year or so doing a lot of important undercover work in Southeast Asia, starting in Kuala Lumpur, making contacts with meth dealers, sex shops, BDSM clubs, spending a significant amount of time smoking meth, tying his dick and balls to his neck in a quest, a dick quest, if you will, to truly get to the bottom, the power bottom of this entire situation. No, but for real. On March 20th, satellite images from the Australian Maritime Safety Authority picked up possible plane debris in the southern Indian Ocean. The photos were taken on March 16th. A search over a 9,000 square mile area turns up jack shit. March 21st, an analysis by the Inmarsat company found that the steady speed and flight path of the plane made it unlikely that a catastrophic accident disabled the plane, right? Again, it's pointing to human error and or human, you know, intentional destruction. March 22nd, an Australian patrol plane found a wooden pallet in the ocean within the search zone, uh, not tied to the flight though. Chinese satellite captures a, a photo of objects possibly from MH370. The Australian Maritime Safety Authority attempts to find the objects, but can't in the search area. Uh, March 23rd, France sends images of floating objects picked up by one of their satellites to Australia. But again, search parties can't find anything in the ocean. 
March 24th, Prime Minister Najib Razak announces that based on their analysis of the plane's final signals, Inmarsat and the UK's Air Accidents Investigation Branch have concluded that the plane crashed in a remote part of the Indian Ocean, 2,500 kilometers southwest of Australia, over 1,500 miles southwest of Australia. For those of you uh, bad with maps, that is not even fucking close to the flight's intended destination of Beijing. It is, in fact, over 6,500 miles south of Beijing and over 4,000 miles from the origin point of Kuala Lumpur. So, you know, just, just a bit off course. Because of the remoteness of the crash site, it was deemed highly unlikely that anyone could survive. That same day, the Australian Maritime Safety Authority began investigating two objects found 1,550 miles southwest of Perth, Australia, a gray or green circular object and an orange rectangular object, the objects not able to be linked to the missing flight. March 26, a satellite picked up 122 floating objects 1,600 miles off the coast of Perth, but again, not able to be linked to the flight. March 27th, the Thai satellite picks up more than 300 floating objects, about 1,700 miles southwest of Perth, also not linked to the flight. March 28th, investigators in five patrol planes saw multiple objects of various colors in a new search area 700 miles north of the search zone or 1,150 miles west rather than southwest of Perth. This suggested the plane might have run out of fuel and crashed sooner than they thought. So they clearly, despite all their best effort, they have no fucking idea where this thing is. March 30th, an Australian search plane spots Dick Quest in a life raft out in the Indian Ocean with the rope around his neck and dick and balls. High as fuck on meth. And would look like a giant dildo poking out of his cowboy boot. His investigation, his quest, continues. But for real, an Australian search plane saw four floating objects in the water. The objects were found and retrieved by Australian and Chinese ships on March 31st. And yet again, not linked to MH370. A robotic submarine was sent out to try to locate the flight recorders. The first of many, none find anything. Surface water uh, search, the surface water search will end in April of 2014. And now the focus will shift to the deep ocean and the ocean floor. Because the current search area, 1,200 miles southwest of Perth, was uncharted terrain, investigators had to map the topography so they could safely tow sonar vehicles. That's a huge Herculean effort here. Her- Herculean? Her- I can't forget that word. It's, it's big. It's a big effort. Uh, April 4th, a Chinese ship detected pulse signals in the Indian Ocean, which mirrored the frequency of a plane's black box, maybe. But then, source of the signal never located. April 6, an Australian ship detects acoustic pings, possibly coming from the flight recorder. The signals came about 1,200 miles northwest of Perth. The AAIB now analyzed the Inmarsat data and discovered that the final partial signal sent from the plane at 8.19 a.m., which uh, was consistent with the location of the acoustic pings. April 7th, an Australian ship, Ocean Shield, picked up signals consistent with the black box, excuse me, in a northern section of the search area. The first signal lasts two hours and 20 minutes, second lasts 13 minutes, but still no location can be determined. April 8th, an Australian ship detects signals consistent with the black box, lasting 12 minutes in total now. A robotic submarine is then used to search the ocean, but the pings spread out over too large of an area and the submarine doesn't find shit. Then, testing finds that a faulty cable in the acoustic equipment probably produced the pings, so shit. Uh, April 13th, the ocean shield finds an oil slick in the water. Collects a sample for analysis. Not connected. April 14th, a Bluefin 21 submarine deployed to scan the ocean floor to search for the plane. Over four days, it will search 35 square miles of ocean floor and find nothing. Over two weeks later, May 2nd, the aerial search is called off. After finding no debris, after almost two months of continual searching, the underwater search begins a new phase the same day using side scan sonar. Underwater searches will continue, conducted by various nations and private companies for years. January 29th, 2015, Malaysia declares the disappearance to be an accident. Everyone on board is presumed dead. The announcement allows families to now seek compensation. March 8th, 2015 marks the one-year anniversary of the plane's disappearance. And now let's meet Blaine Gibson, who will do more as just one dude to help solve this puzzle than literally every other person, nation combined. This guy's a character. Not quite a Dick Quest level of character, but still a character. Uh, He's a retired lawyer. Single guy who was 57 years old at this time, born in California, based in Seattle, who had received a large inheritance early on in life and made it his priority to visit literally every nation in the world. He had visited over 170 nations by the time MH370 disappeared. 
Uh, he'd led uh, an interesting life. He'd lived in Laos for a while where he owned a karaoke bar with a business partner, spent a few years in Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union, working as a legal consultant. Uh, he considers himself an amateur adventurer. Once traveled to Siberia to investigate the Tunguska meteor crash site, spent time in Central America investigating the collapse of the Maya civilization. Uh, once traveled to Ethiopia to search for the Ark of the Covenant, the supposed wooden chest clad with gold, which holds two stone tablets of the Ten Commandments. Uh, he's basically a real life Indiana Jones, a dude who loves to try to solve strange mysteries. And he became obsessed with finding out what happened to MH370. He joined a, a Facebook group shortly after the plane's disappearance, about the disappearance. And early on, he thought that the search parties were looking in the wrong places. Rather than conducting underwater searches, he thought they should be studying ocean current patterns and looking for debris that might have washed up on some beach. He shows up to the one-year commemoration of the flight's disappearance held at a shopping mall in Malaysia. The purpose of the commemoration was to honor the missing passengers and to put pressure on the government to give out more info. The main speaker was Grace Nathan, whose mom was on the plane. Uh, Grace is a Malaysian criminal defense lawyer who specializes in death penalty cases and has been a representative of the families. Blaine speaks to Grace and the two become friends. And now he gets looking for that debris. On July 29, 2015, the first piece of debris washes up on the French island of Reunion. Uh, never knew this island existed, by the way. It has almost 900,000 people living on it. A little over 400 miles west of the African island of Madagascar, 2,300 miles west of the search area in the Indian Ocean, and it is beautiful. 970 square miles of volcanoes and beaches and sugarcane farms and jungle and three decent-sized cities and more, totally uninhabited before the French showed up in the 17th century. I had to pull myself away from travel videos to refocus on research. I wanted to live there for a little while. This place looks fantastic. And on a beach here, a cleanup crew finds a six-foot piece of debris. Crew foreman Johnny Bagwe uh, thought it looked like it came from an airplane. He considered making it a memorial, planting flowers around it, but called a radio station instead. Police took the debris away. It was identified as the flapperon, or as a flapperon, uh, which is a uh, piece attached to the trailing edge of the wings. After hearing this news, amateur sleuth Blaine Indiana Jones Light Gibson flies to Australia, speaks with some Australian oceanographers, asks them the most likely locations to look for washed up MH370 debris based on maps of ocean currents. And he was told to look on the northeast coast of Madagascar and Mozambique, very near Reunion Island. Eventually, 26 more pieces of debris will be found on beaches in Tanzania, Mozambique, South Africa, Madagascar, and uh, Mauritius. I won't list out the dates and places for the discovery of each and every piece because uh, that's pretty boring. But eventually, three of the 27 pieces will be confirmed to have come from MH370. Numerous other pieces likely came from the flight. Uh, two pieces came from inside of the cabin, which suggested the plane had broken apart. Investigators studied the wing flapper on and a piece of the right wing flap that eventually washed up in Tanzania. And the debris showed that the plane had not undergone a controlled descent, which means that the pilot... Uh, was not guiding the plane to the water. Uh, researchers will theorize that the plane was likely vertical or near vertical when it hit the water based on damage to the debris. Uh, Blaine Gibson traveled to Mozambique in February of 2016, paid a man to take him to a sandbank where fishermen uh, would often go to collect washed up nets and buoys. His guide found a two foot gray triangular scrap with the words no step stenciled on the surface. And he had a feeling this was a piece of MH370 so they took it uh, to the Australian consul. It will eventually be identified as the plane's horizontal stabilizer panel. One of three conclusive pieces. And there's several others that are pretty conclusive, but there's three that are like, yep, for sure. Serial numbers type stuff, you know, link it conclusively to the flight. June of 2016, Blaine Gibson flies to Madagascar, finds three pieces of debris his first day there, two pieces of debris a few days later. Next week, people bring him three more. Word spreads he's willing to pay for debris. According to Gibson, a whole village goes on a, uh, on a search with him because they heard he was offering up to $40 a piece. Uh, here, Gibson finds uh, about a third of the debris of the debris suspected to have come from MH370. And his discovery confirms the theory that the plane flew for six hours or more before breaking apart. More on him in a second. July 22nd, 2016, Australia, China, and Malaysia agree that if they can't find the plane, by the time they've searched 46,000 square miles, they're going to end the underwater search. And then that end comes January 17th, 2017, almost three years since the plane goes, uh, went missing. The three countries released a joint statement that said, Today the last search vessel has left the underwater search area. 
Despite every effort using the best science available, cutting edge technology, as well as modeling and advice from highly skilled professionals who are the best in their fields, unfortunately, the search has not been able to locate the aircraft. The decision to suspend the underwater search has not been taken lightly, nor without sadness. We remain hopeful that new information will come to light and that at some point in the future, the aircraft will be located. Meanwhile, Dick Quest is spotted again in that life raft out in the Indian Ocean, still has a rope around his neck and dick and balls, still high as fuck on meth, with what looks like a giant dildo poking out of his cowboy boot. Motherfucker has been floating around for almost three years with no fresh water, somehow living only on meth and autoerotic asphyxiation. He hasn't found anything related to MH370, but he has inspired millions of people, proving that where there is a will, there really is a way if you have enough fucking meth. I love Dick Quest. Uh, August 7th, 2017, uh, Voice 370, an advocacy group for families of the missing pastors and crew of MH370, called on the government to release their data to independent experts for more analysis. Also in August of 2017, Blaine Gibson arranges a system to move more possible debris. He turns over everything he finds to the Madagascar government, who then gives it to the Malaysian consul, who then ships it to Kuala Lumpur. And on August 24th, 2017, the Malaysian honorary consul who's overseen all this shit is shot and killed by an assassin. Uh, his killer has never been caught. And Gibson assumes there's a connection between his murder and getting to the bottom of the mystery of MH370. And now he goes into hiding. He continues to help search for answers, but does, uh, you know, more work from behind the keyboard now than out in the open. And he makes sure his correspondences online are encrypted. He stops talking about his travel plans, stops using traditional email or talking on the phone and starts to think that occasionally he is being followed and photographed. So what the fuck is going on there? That murder could just be a coincidence, but feels suspicious. January 16, 2018, the Malaysian government announces the beginning of a second search led by Ocean Infinity, uh, which is an American company uh, who had received permission from the Malaysian government to continue their search until May of 2018. After public outcry from the families, Malaysia Airlines allowed Ocean Infinity to start the search on the condition they'll only be paid if they find the plane or the plane's black boxes. Ocean Infinity uses a Norwegian research ship with 65 crew members and eight drones with sonar and cameras to search the ocean floor, mile after mile after mile. On January 21st, they officially begin their search. Five months later, May 29th, 2018, the Malaysian government announces their involvement in the second search is over. Less than two weeks later, June 8th, Ocean Infinity officially ends their search as well. They ended up uh, searching 77,220 square miles of ocean floor and didn't find shit and lost a ton of money. July 31st, 2018, the Malaysian government issues a final report on the MH370 disappearance. They've concluded that mechanical malfunction was extremely unlikely and the change in flight path likely resulted from manual inputs, aka probably one of the pilots. Someone inside the plane manually changed the flight path, but they don't know who and they don't know why. The Director General of Civil Aviation Malaysia, Abdul Rahman, resigns that same day. The final report stated that the ATC failed to initiate proper emergency responses and there was no record that they alerted the Air Force that the plane was missing. Why didn't they do that? We don't know. Are they hiding something? Maybe. In August of 2018, Air Transport, uh, Air Transport uh, Jean Damarie, a French organization that handles airport security. I don't know how to say that word <laughs> if I try and not do an accent of any kind. They launched another investigation. They plan to verify technical data from the Inmarsat satellite. And they eventually find fucking nothing that helps solve the mystery. On August 20th, 2018, more panel debris is found in Madagascar, but still no one has any idea exactly where the plane crashed, where the primary body of wreckage is, where the bodies are, where the black boxes are, nothing. And we still, to this day, don't have any of that info. And that will take us out of this timeline. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. So what the hell happened? Well, let's look at some conspiracy theories. And let's allow Cheesecake Factory store detective Sonny Hollister to set the tone of our investigation. Sonny Hollister here again, meet sex. Cheesecake Factory store detective. Just wanted to pop in here and give you some professional advice. As someone who has successfully solved many a mystery. 
like the time no one could figure out who was walking out with our tablecloth. And in less than three weeks, I was able to apprehend the very woman who hired me, General Manager Susan Watkins. She thought no one would think she was taking any fine linen because she made the most money, the last person anyone would suspect. But the last person is often the first person that I look at. Anyone who thinks they're above the law is someone ready to break it. Another time, when I was first assigned the Cheesecake Factory beat, someone had been skimming the cheddar from the freezer, almost two pounds of cheese a month for several months. Lenny, the 315-pound dishwasher, was suspected, but after watching the man eat and use the restroom often, I quickly learned that he was explosively lactose intolerant. Now, he was more of a spicy rigatona vodka guy than a cheese hound. Meanwhile, I noticed that Cindy, the 105-pound hostess who only ate California chopped salads, kept taking slices of Cinnabon cinnamon swirl cheesecake to go. And who was picking her up? Her 230-pound college linebacker boyfriend. A walk-on guy. No scholarship. A guy who could use a little extra cheddar. And bang, bang, chicken and shrimp. I had my man. So keep an open mind, meat sacks. Sometimes the person least suspected should be the person you've selected. Until next time, you keep listening to true crime and other tales, and I'll keep stopping by, and I'll keep stopping it. You know, stopping stuff is what I, what I do. So anyway, stay sunny, everyone. I'm going to go grab a snack. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Sonny. Not sure that was super helpful, but, you know, I guess it didn't hurt anything. Uh, there are so many surrounding, uh, you know, uh, conspiracies surrounding the disappearance of MH370. Uh, William Long Longavisha, Longa, Longavisha. Oh, William. You have a fucking crazy ass Germanic last name. Uh, a former national correspondent for the Atlantic and a pilot wrote in a 2019 article for the Atlantic on the disappearance. The mystery surrounding MH370 has been a focus of continued investigation and a source of sometimes feverish public speculation. The loss devastated families on four continents. The idea that a sophisticated machine with its modern instruments and redundant communications could simply vanish seems beyond the realm of possibility. It is hard to permanently delete an email and living off the grid is nearly unachievable, even when the attempt is deliberate. A Boeing 777 is meant to be electronically accessible at all times. The disappearance of the airplane has provoked a host of theories. Many are preposterous. All are given life by the fact that in this age, Commercial airplanes don't just vanish, but MH370 did vanish. And a fair amount of people think members of the Malaysian government covered something up. But maybe they again, uh, again, they only covered up embarrassment. Uh, in the same Atlantic article, a source said, it became clear that the primary objective of the Malaysians was to make the subject just go away. From the start, there was this instinctive bias against being open and transparent. Not because they were hiding some deep, dark secret, but because they did not know where the truth really lay. And they were afraid that something might come out that would be embarrassing. Were they covering up? Yes. They were covering up for the unknown. And what could uh, some unknown possibility be? Uh, what are some of the most well-known conspiracy theories about what happened to MH370? Blogger Saucy Sailoris, a British woman who posted back in 2014 a lot about stuff like uh, tarot card reading, snake hunting, uh, being a psychic, uh, a lot about sailing. Uh, super legit not crazy at all source, uh, posted one briefly popular but ultimately proven false online conspiracy. She claimed she was on a sailboat in Southeast Asia with her husband on March 8th, right, 2014, the day the flight disappeared, and she saw what looked like a missile approaching. She said this missile was a plane bathed in a strange orange glow and trailing smoke. And she came to the conclusion that the plane was a, on a suicide mission against the Chinese Navy stationed farther out at sea. When she learned about the disappearance of MH370, she connected the dots. But uh, where she was doesn't match any of the major investigations conclusions as to where the flight uh, was likely flying and debris that has been found does not point to the plane going down in a big fiery explosion. So the saucy sailoress, probably full of shit. Uh, a report that Captain Zahari was found alive in a hospital in Taiwan and suffering from amnesia gained traction for a little while. But that news came from a satirical website. <laughs> that publishes fake stories. And like with all sites that publish fake stories, some people not skilled in deducing fact from obvious bullshit, uh, they just believe the obvious bullshit to be fact. 
Uh, New York writer Jeff Wise, he theorized that one of the onboard systems was reprogrammed to provide false data, which showed that the plane turned towards Indian Ocean, when really it turned north to uh, Kazakhstan. He suggested that the Russians stole the plane to distract from a conflict in uh, Crimea. Wise published a book about his th uh, theory, and it's uh, very well rated on Amazon. But after reading a lot of reviews from people who loved it, even like uh, most of his supporters come to a conclusion of, ah, I guess maybe, but that's a stretch. Uh, Jeff connects a lot of dots, it seems, with pretty flimsy, uh, I can't prove this, but you can't disprove this. Maybe it happened, connective tissue string, but no actual compelling evidence. So I'm going to say probably not. Uh, one online poster blogging as Danny B. Cummins uh, thinks that his dad might be behind MH370's disappearance. Apparently, Danny B. Cummins doesn't know where his dad was on March 8th or 9th, 2014, or really where his dad was at almost any point in 2014. He thinks his dad might be responsible for the majority of all murders attributed to serial killers in the U.S. between 1972 and now. Uh, he's pretty sure based on his dad's unknown whereabouts and overall sketchiness, that his dad has killed thousands and thousands of people, so what would be uh, another 239? He thinks his dad probably used a hammer to get into the cockpit. Uh, his dad's worked most of his life in construction and is really good at hammering shit, like a lot of other carpenters and murderers, and his dad is really good at pushing buttons and may have hammered his way into the cockpit, pushed a bunch of buttons, and parachuted out of the plane. This theory hasn't really gotten much traction, but uh, maybe it should, you know? Where the fuck was my dad that much? I mean, where was that blogger's dad? You know, that March. Hmm. Uh, moving along. Uh, journalist Ian Higgins wrote in his 2019 book, The Hunt for MH370, that Captain Zahari may have parachuted out of the plane to meet a secret lover waiting for him on a boat. Okay. Ian others speculate that he depressurized the aircraft to kill the passengers, then jumped out when the plane reached 3,000 feet, then used a fake ID to start a new life. Ian was informed that uh, Zahari wanted to leave his wife, but because of his religious beliefs, it would be difficult to get out of the marriage through a divorce. And I'm going to file that theory under get the fuck out of here. Seriously? Dude thought that killing 238 people and launching what he had to have known would be a massive multinational investigation was the best way to get out of a marriage? I mean, people do crazy shit for sure. So maybe, but someone clever enough to pull that off, uh, probably also someone who uh, could figure out a much less dramatic way to disappear. I mean, just don't come back from one of your many, many flights out of the country. Just land in a foreign nation. One of the many you go to all the time as an international pilot. Then use your fake ID to start your uh, new life and escape your old one. Way easier than jumping out of a uh, plane full of people, you know, uh, where you're going to kill a couple hundred other people. And also, you'd have to be an expert parachutist to fucking jump out of a plane crashing, like diving down into the sea. And then also like make it into a little boat. In the middle of the sea. And there's no record of him ever, you know, parachuting before. 2018, British uh, video producer Ian Wilson claimed that he found a plane in the jungle of Cambodia. Just using Google Maps. <laughs> no, no one else, no one else thought to do that. Uh, spoiler alert, he, uh, he didn't do that. He died over two years ago at the age of 81. And I'm going to file that claim under dementia. March of 2018, an Australian wackadoodle named Peter McMahon claimed he also found the wreckage on Google Earth. He claimed he saw the wreckage riddled with bullet holes. A few miles from Round Island, uh, Mauritius, he believed that the U.S. refused to search the area and was uh, withholding information. The Civil Aviation Authority Malaysia analyzed his claims for whatever reason. And the images uh, that you know, he pointed to and found it all to be baseless. I mean, come on. L let me get this straight. The U.S. government engaged in a massive cover-up to make sure that no one searched the area where the wreckage was, but didn't bother to have one computer programmer at the NSA or somewhere take like, I don't know, an hour of their afternoon to alter an image or two on Google Earth. I'm going to file that one under, uh, that theory is dumb as shit. A former Malaysian Prime Minister, uh, Matahir Mohammed, wrote that he thinks the CIA was involved in the disappearance and that Boeing and government agencies are able to control commercial planes remotely. He said airplanes don't just disappear. Actually, a lot have, but he said that. They, he said they don't just disappear, certainly not these days, with all the powerful communication systems, radio and satellite tracking, and filmless cameras, which operate almost indefinitely and possess huge storage capacities. For some reason, the media will not print anything that involves Boeing or the CIA. And the media does actually report on Boeing and the CIA quite a bit. I'm sure both organizations, most of the CIA, uh, can still hide stuff, but the media is not afraid of either organization anymore. You know? Uh, also, uh, Matahir is a 98-year-old guy 
who openly believes various uh, Jews control the world conspiracy narratives. And he thinks the Holocaust was greatly exaggerated. So I don't know how much his ramblings on this should be trusted. Dude also said it would be okay for Muslims to kill millions of French people since the French had killed so many Muslims in centuries past. Okay. Uh, Reddit user Dark Spectre, obviously solid source, wrote that the plane's disappearance may be linked to Edward Snowden's data link about uh, U.S. surveillance. 20 people on board, as I mentioned, worked for Freescale Semiconductor, and that company worked with the NSA on surveillance tech. Uh, this info comes from Snowden's leaked documents, and Dark Spectre posted, We have the American IBM technical storage executive for Malaysia, a man working in mass storage aggregation for the company implicated by the Snowden papers for providing their services to assist the NSA in surveilling the Chinese. And now this bunch of U.S. chip guys working for a global leader in embedded processing solutions, embedded smartphone tech and defense contracting all together on a plane and disappeared. Coincidence? Uh, yeah, probably. I mean, coincidences do happen. Coincidences uh, do happen every day. William S. Burroughs was wrong when he said nothing happens by coincidence. Get the fuck out of here. Uh, and, and if this is true, so what happened to the plane, Dark Spectre? Well, they haven't posted about that. Uh, another theory that came out right after the plane went missing was that the passengers are actually safe somewhere. Several families of passengers reported that when they called their missing loved ones, the phone rang instead of going straight to voicemail. And other passengers' instant messaging accounts remained online after the plane went missing. 19 different families all signed a statement that they called uh, their missing passenger and the phone rang instead of going to voicemail. But wireless analyst Jeff Kagan told N NBC that with some phones, you hear ringing when you call but that doesn't mean that the phone is actually ringing on the other person's side. Sometimes the network is just searching for the phone. If the network can't find the phone, the call gets dropped. And other wireless, wireless analysts have confirmed that to be true. Another Reddit user, uh, Dick Quest, name sounds familiar, maybe wondered if the flight had anything to do with anyone on, the, on, on board being super worried that their families were going to find out that sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes they like to walk around a city park in the middle of the night with a rope connecting their dick and balls to their neck while high as fuck on meth while wearing cowboy boots with a dildo or three popping out of the sides. And maybe he wrote, such a shame if that's what happened because doing that is actually extremely common. And if more people just finally admitted that they did that too, no one would have to feel embarrassed about it anymore. And no more planes would have to crash because people are worried about others finding out that they do something that is very normal, healthy, maybe even cool. And doesn't hurt anybody. Hmm. I actually like that conspiracy. I'm open to that one. Uh, of course, there were also claims about alien abduction. There were reports online that the plane was found and that there was a black box recording of someone saying, SOS, they are not human. This claim uh, likely originates from Your Newswire. Uh, March 18th, 2018, the shitty fake news site, uh, Your Newswire, now called newspunch.com, uh, originator and pusher of so much trash, as wackadoodle as it gets, published an article reporting that the black box had been found with a disturbing message. Images have emerged of the wreckage of missing Malaysia Airlines flight MH370, just hours after a black box recording surfaced featuring an eerie message. The message was in military code sign, which translates to, Danger SOS. It is dire for you to evacuate. Be cautious. They are not human SOS. Danger SOS. The eerie voicemail also gave a series of numbers. Users started doing their investigations on the meaning behind the series of numbers, and the numbers, when used as coordinates, point to a location near Malaysia. Digging deeper, it reveals that it was within the area in the radar where flight MH370 was last seen. Uh, well, that's all bullshit. Uh, that site uh, continually has their bullshit allegations perpetually shot down by fact checkers. If the entire internet consisted of sites like newspunch.com, we would all be best off just burning ourselves alive. Uh, ideally, the people who created that website would burn themselves alive to at least kind of make up for all the disinformation they have pumped out over the years. Uh, Pizzagate nonsense, Bill Gates is an Illuminati monster bullshit, uh, the Las Vegas shooting was a false flag operation, and a bunch of uh, additional, ah, go fuck yourself. Uh, thank you for helping dumb down society bullshit. Uh, yeah, the black box has never been found. Nevertheless, that story gained popularity worldwide, added fuel to conspiracy fire. Uh, conspiracy theorists also suggested the plane disappeared in a spot on the exact opposite side of the world from the Bermuda Triangle. However, because those people are not good with geography, they did not calculate that correctly. 
And it's not true. Uh, the designated search area is actually on the opposite side of the globe from the Caribbean Sea, close to the Bermuda Triangle, but not in the Bermuda Triangle. In March of 2014, a Malaysian politician tweeted, New Bermuda Triangle detected in Vietnam waters. Well-equipped, sophisticated devices are of no use. And then a bunch of people made fun of him, like, what the fuck are you talking about, you idiot? How are you uh, one of our politicians? And then he apologized and never talked about it again. Uh, the Malaysian police initially refused to rule out the possibility of a life insurance scam. Tan Sri Khalid uh, Abdul Bakar, Inspector General of Police, said, Maybe somebody on the flight has bought a huge sum of insurance who wants family to gain from it or somebody who has owed somebody so much money. You know, we are looking at all possibilities. So maybe not a conspiracy as much as just a dude thinking, I don't know, it might happen. Malaysian authorities did look into each passenger's life insurance policies to see if anyone had purchased a policy recently and they had not. Another theory states that the plane flew off to attack in a, in a mili- in a, excuse me. Another theory states that the plane flew off to attack an American military base on Diego Garcia. Uh, which is actually in British Indian Ocean Territory and was shot down. The Diego Garcia Base, a.k.a. Naval Support Facility Diego Garcia, a.k.a. Footprint of Freedom, a.k.a. Camp Thunder Cove, that's a dope name, is a British base that leases part of its space to the U.S. military. And it's home to thousands of American troops, sophisticated radar, uh, space tracking, and a a communications facility. Uh, Mark Dugain, a former French airline director and novelist, claimed that the American fighter jets shot down the plane because they thought it was going to attack the military base on the island. What? Uh, And allegedly, a British intelligence officer warned him not to look too closely into this case because of some risk involved. Uh, I'm going to file that under cool story, bro. What proof does he have of this? Uh, Nothing. My big problem with this theory is, how would U.S. fighter pilots not recognize a Boeing 777 as being a, a commercial passenger plane, not a military aircraft, and think it was going to attack a military base? Uh, Mark has also never said why the pilots or terrorists or whoever he thinks was flying it would fly the plane over 2,100 miles off course to make it to this island to, I guess, crash into it. He just made a pretty random claim. No actual evidence points to this at all. Uh, Some other people believe that North Korea is responsible for the MH370 disappearance because on March 5th, 2014, just three days before the disappearance, North Korea, quote, nearly took out a Chinese plane passing through the trajectory of one of their missiles just seven minutes after it was fired. However, based on where debris washed up and where satellite pings and other at least somewhat credible evidence has the plane crashing, the plane never flew even fucking close to North Korea, like never came within 2,000 miles of it. So get out of here. Uh, There was also some speculation online for a while that Mossad, the National Intelligence Agency of Israel, blew the plane up. Uh, NoDisinfo.com published an article claiming that Mossad sabotaged the flight. A quote from the article reads, Who blew up the Malaysia Airlines aircraft en route from Kuala Lumpur to Beijing? Or Kuala Lumpur to Beijing. Who was on the jet that would be necessary to assassinate? It was surely destroyed through sabotage. Stolen passports were also used by unknown individuals to apparently board the jets. The use of two stolen passports has been confirmed. Who else is there to suspect other than the Mossad? It is the entity alone which has a history of committing such high crimes through the use of forged identities. It is their exclusive system that is these rabid Zionist Jews who plot and commit great crimes against humanity, murdering people outright through the means of deception, assisted through the reliance on forged identities. This could not be a coincidence. Some group of treacherous ones plotted a plot to take down the jet, killing all on board. The use of the stolen passports is categorical proof of such a plot, and the likely culprit is Mossad. A whole bunch of people uh, reposted this article on social media not knowing that it came from a satirical fucking website. A website also no longer around, right? The Onion might as well have reported that. And people mistook intentionally over-the-top anti-Semitic satirical drivel intended to mock actual anti-Semitism as actual news. God, education is so important. Uh, For a while, hijacking was one of the main theories for why MH370 crashed into the ocean, but no known terrorist organizations have ever come forward to claim responsibility. No real ones. Uh, March 9th, 2014, a group called the Chinese Martyrs Brigade claimed responsibility for the plane crash. They sent an email to Chinese journalists saying, you kill one of our clan, we kill 100 of you. The message was sent with an anonymous encrypted email service that makes it almost impossible to trace. Uh, The problem with this is no one had ever heard of this group before. The Malaysian Minister of Transportation told reporters that there is no credibility to this group's claims and no one has ever heard of this alleged group since. 
Uh, regarding the stolen passport guys, the flight manifest listed an Australian and an Italian, but these men were actually identified as Iranians who used stolen passports to get on the plane. Uh, investigators initially did suspect they were terrorists, but later determined that they were men seeking asylum. They were just dudes trying to get the fuck away from a place with terrorists. Uh, the two passengers were carrying stolen Italian and Austrian passports using the names Luigi Moraldi Spaghetti Linguini Maserati Toro Banderas Hot Hot Father Daddy Dibbler or just Luigi Moraldi and Christian Kozel, respectively. Uh, Iranian men, again, seeking asylum in Europe. Uh, Poria Noor Mohammed Murdad, just 18 years old, wanted to eventually join his mom in Germany. He was taking an indirect route from Iran to Kuala Lumpur to, to you know, hide his escape, then planned to travel from Beijing to Amsterdam and then to Frankfurt. One of his last social media posts was a Facebook status update. Said he was feeling excited after he arrived in Kuala Lumpur. Second man was 29-year-old Delavar Sayed uh, Mohammed Reza. Less is known about him. Uh, a source told the BBC that both men lived with him before boarding their flight, saying they were young like me. Poria was quiet, nice. He was never naughty. It's kind of a funny choice of word, naughty. Uh, so was his friend. I heard them talking. They wanted to go to Europe to seek asylum. Uh, but who is the source? Only listed as a guy named Mohammed. How do we know he's not bullshitting? Well, I mean, we don't. Uh, this conspiracy at least reads as somewhat possible to me, right? We don't actually know that these guys were truly seeking asylum. They, they could have been terrorists. Uh, but if they were, why didn't their organization take credit? Why didn't they try and crash the flight into a place, any place, with a bunch of people? Or into some power plant or military base? Some place, any place, other than the middle of the fucking ocean, where the plane damaged nothing other than the plane itself and everyone on board. Sure doesn't seem like a terrorist act. I mean, it's possible, but come on. Uh, historian Norman uh, Davies wrote in his book, Beneath Another Sky, A Global Journey into History, that cyber hijackers could have used technology designed to prevent hijacking to hijack the plane. The plane was equipped with Boeing's Honeywell Uninterruptible Autopilot Computer, which could have been technically hacked and reprogrammed. Davies told the Sunday Times, there are reports that the cargo detailed in the manifest didn't add up. I don't know what it might have been carrying, but it may have been carrying something somebody didn't want to get to China. Uh, Davies uh, was, in fact, uh, correct when he said the cargo didn't add up. In July of 2019, engineer uh, Ghislaine Watrellos, whose wife and two kids were on the plane, told French news outlet Le Parisien that French investigators discovered that the plane had additional cargo. They found this out while looking at the passengers and baggage reported on the plane. 89 kilograms, or roughly 200 pounds of cargo, was added to the flight list after takeoff. One container was overloaded. Uh, with what? No one knows. I don't know why this was added. You know, a flight attendant uh, could have been doing someone a favor. This is interesting, but it doesn't explain so much like the zigzagging crazy flight path. Um, another theory will in a little bit uh, before that. Also, the uh, being hacked while remotely technically possible. No expert has said that they think that that is what actually happened. And it really wouldn't explain the weird flight path either. Uh, experts seem to almost unanimously think that a hijacking was unlikely because the cockpit door was tightly secured with an electric bolt, you know, a hijacking from within the plane. Uh, the pilots in this 777 had video cameras they monitored that would show someone trying to get in. Also, the diversion from the planned route occurred less than two minutes after Zahari's goodnight message. Very unlikely a hijacker would know the exact time to take control of the plane and take over the cockpit without pilots sending out a distress signal. Furthermore, every single passenger and crew member were uh, investigated and cleared by Malaysian and Chinese investigators with help from the FBI. Three governments looked into this, cleared all of them. Possible, very unlikely, that there were stowaways hidden in the equipment bay. Uh, they may have been able to access circuit breakers that could have unbolted the cockpit door, but the pilots would have heard the sound of the bolts clicking open and again would have had time to send out a distress signal. The stowaways also would have had to uh, get past the cabin crew and surveillance cameras. Very unlikely. Also don't know the motive for a hijacking because, again, no terrorist groups have claimed responsibility for the plane's disappearance. So, again, what the fuck happened? After years of investigation, it seems like most experts believe that the plane crash was caused by Dick Quest. Uh, they think that out of his mind on meth, horny as fuck, thanks to that rope connecting his dick to his, uh, you know, his neck to his dick and balls, Dick and his cowboy boot dildo wanted to come on each and every person on that plane. How did he get into the plane undetected? Well, he was flown to the plane mid-flight by the reticulans, the greys. Wake up, sheeple. Who else? Those fuckers wanted in on some kinky sex action, right? Those poor passengers and crew, remember, their final moments being anally probed by horny aliens for hours while the flight continued to coast along on autopilot. 
being roped into Dick Quest's sex game, literally roped into them, tangled up between his neck and dick and balls. It was an intergalactic, debaucherous, meth-fueled orgy. And before the plane slammed into the sea, Dick Quest and his reticulum buddies just fucking beamed back to their spaceship. Case closed. Boom. Damn you, Dick Quest. No, of course not. No, after years of investigation, experts believe uh, the plane crash was intentional. No form of technical failure, mechanical failure, system failures, a freak accident like lightning or bird strikes, poor weather conditions, explosions, decompressions, missile strikes, bombs, etc., can explain the flight path the plane took. From what I can tell, the most credible people who have studied all this evidence the longest seem to believe that the overwhelmingly most likely scenario is that someone inside the cockpit took control of the plane or were already in control of the plane and deviated from the flight plan. This occurred between 1.01 a.m. and 1.21 a.m. after the plane reached a cruising altitude of 35,000 feet and the system disappeared from secondary radar when whoever decided that the flight was never going to make it to Beijing turned off the transponder. When the airplane dropped from secondary radar, it is likely that one of the pilots was dead, incapacitated, or locked out of the cockpit because very unlikely that both would agree to crash a plane with over 200 people on board, killing not only all of them, but also themselves. One pilot doing that is super fucking rare. Two working together to do it, two who weren't close friends, like very improbable, the most improbable. Primary radar records indicate that the person flying the plane switched off the autopilot feature because the turn to the southwest was very sharp, had to have been done by hand. Also been suggested that someone deliberately depressurized the plane because around that time, most of the electrical system was shut down which temporarily severed the satellite link. American electrical engineer Mike Exner has studied the radar data and believes that when the pilot made the turn, the plane also ascended to 40,000 feet. He and other experts think that this climb was meant to speed up depressurization to kill passengers faster. In his opinion, this would have been the only way to prevent the passengers from retaliating and trying to stop the suicide mission when they noticed something had went terribly wrong. Their oxygen masks would have come down, but those are only intended to be used for about 15 minutes at altitudes below 13,000 feet. In this situation, everyone in the cabin would have become incapacitated in just a few minutes, then fallen unconscious, and then died. Exner is a member of the independent group, uh, and it's not like, like, it's not an independent group, it's called independent group, a collection of volunteer engineers and scientists who meet over the internet and work together to investigate, uh, or, you know, they have met to investigate the plane's disappearance. Not a bunch of wackadoodles, legit experts. Uh, the Australian government, formally thank them for their work on this. And uh, the cockpit had four pressurized oxygen masks that would have lasted several hours. The person who depressurized the plane most likely put one on so they could continue flying. Primary radar showed the plane approached Penang at about 600 miles an hour. That means the flight approached Butterworth Air Base, where Malaysian F-18 interceptors are stationed, and an air defense radar. A former official told The Atlantic that before the accident report was released in July of 2018, Air Force officers demanded to edit it. Uh, the section of the report titled Malaysian Military Radar gives a timeline suggesting that the air defense radar was being monitored and that the military knew the identity of the aircraft despite the transponder, be uh, despite the transponder being off and chose not to pursue it because it was a friendly aircraft. If this is true, then why did Malaysia mislead other governments to think that the plane landed over the South China Sea? The former Malaysian defense minister said in an interview with Australian TV well, if you're not going to shoot it down, what's the point of sending an interceptor up? It sounds like they just, they just fucked up a bunch. Uh, the depressurization theory sadly doesn't just come from the imaginations of the members of the independent group. Uh, sadly, this has happened before. It comes from the tragic crash of Helios Airways Flight 522. In 2005, the plane veered off course during a flight from Cyprus to Athens, Greece. The crew ignored all radio communication. Two F-16s took off to intercept the plane and the pilot saw that the captain's chair was empty. The co-pilot was not moving and a pair of oxygen masks were dangling from the ceiling. 117 passengers and crew all suffocated. It was now a ghost flight. No one alive on board, but still sailing through the air because the plane's autopilot was still functioning. Man, how creepy and sad. The F-16 traveled alongside the plane until it crashed into a hill, prepared to shoot it out of the sky if it was going to crash into a populated area. Investigations later proved that the pilot's had not done that intentionally. It was a mistake. Very tragic mistake. They had failed to properly pressurize the cabin. The crew neglected to set the pressurization system to automatic during takeoff checks. And because of that one mistake, everyone died. That is actually scarier to me than some rogue pilot wanting to kill themselves. Uh, I didn't know a mistake like that could have that consequence. Uh, so has a pilot ever decided before MH370 to take out up to 200 or more innocent people? 
just to take their own life? Yes, that's happened. Happened a few times in aviation history. In 1997, a captain working for Silk Air, a Singaporean airline, Flight 185, believed to disabled believed to have disabled the plane's black boxes and crashed a flight into a river. 104 people died. 1999, a co-pilot of Egypt Air 990 crashed into the ocean off the coast of Long Island, New York. All 217 people on board died. 2013, the captain of LAM Mozambique Airlines, Flight 470, flew his plane into the ground, killing all 33 people on board. And the year following the disappearance of MH370, on March 24, 2015, co-pilot Andres Lubitz of German Wings Flight 9525 waited for his pilot to go to the bathroom, then locked him out of the cockpit, then crashed into the French Alps, killing everyone on board, 150 fatalities. Uh, Lubitz had a history of depression and had studied the MH370 disappearance. So this shit does happen. Not often, but it does. So which pilot likely crashed MH370 into the Indian Ocean if that's what happened? Uh, More likely that Zahari Shah was the perpetrator because Farrakh was young and optimistic and had plans to get married and had no history of mental health troubles. Zahari, on the other hand, may have been struggling. In official reports and statements from his family, Zahari is regarded as a good pilot, a family man who liked to use his flight simulator as a hobby. The Malaysian police wrote in their report, the PIC's pilot in command's ability to handle stress at work was reported to be good. No known history of apathy, anxiety, or irritability. There were no significant changes in his lifestyle, interpersonal conflict, or family stresses. There were no behavioral signs of social isolation, changes of habits or interest. On studying the PIC's behavioral pattern on the CCTV at the airport on the day of the flight and prior three flights, there were no significant behavioral challenges or behavioral changes observed. On all the CCT, CCTV recordings, and the appearance was similar, i.e. well-groomed and attired. The gait, posture, facial expressions, and mannerisms were his normal characteristics. However, it doesn't seem like they did a good investigation here because uh, uh, William Longavisha, Longavisha, Bisha, his fucking name, L-A-N-G-E-W-I-E-S-C-H-E. I'm just going to call him fucking Billy going forward. Uh, Billy traveled to Kuala Lumpur and spoke with people who knew Zahari, and they said he was often lonely and sad. His wife had just moved out. He was living in their second house. He told friends that he spent his time pacing around the house, just waiting for days between flights to pass by. According to these people, Zahari had an affair with a married woman that cost him his marriage. He was also reportedly obsessed with two much younger models he found on social media, uh, left a lot of comments on their Facebook profiles. Neither model uh, commented back. Neither wanted fuck all to do with him. Zahari uh, spoke to his children. Yes, but the relationship was distant. Uh, The relationship was strained with his kids. Zahari was active on social media in the months before his final flight, very active, which may have been a response to loneliness he was feeling in his personal life. Numerous investigators ended up suspecting he did suffer from depression. And check this shit out. This next detail seals the deal for me. The FBI examined Zahari's at-home flight simulator and found that he had experimented with a flight pattern that was eerily similar to the final erratic way the fuck off course flight of MH370, the final flight, heading north around Indonesia, flying south for a long period of time, then running out of fuel to the southwest over the Indian Ocean. Malaysia officials dismissed this as just, you know, one of hundreds of flights recorded on his flight simulator. Yeah, but why would he simulate such a fucking weird flight that would certainly end in the death of everyone on the plane? That's a very weird coincidence, if nothing else. Uh, In July of 2016, New York Magazine obtained and published the flight simulator data. Investigators found that Captain Zahari conducted that uh, that odd flight simulation similar to the final flight path at MH370 less than a month before the plane went missing. So, more suspicious. And Malaysian authorities withheld this info from their first public report on the investigation. Why? Embarrassed? Afraid it would make their national airline look bad? After that first report, Malaysia turned over Zahari's flight simulator hard drive to the FBI. Uh, He had built this flight simulator himself, recorded his sessions on the hard drive. And before discovering the strange simulation, Australian and U.S. authorities were already suspicious of Zahari. In January 2016, Byron Bailey, an experienced pilot, wrote for the Australian. Several months after the MH370 disappearance, I was told by a government source that the FBI had recovered from Zahari's home computer deleted information showing flight plan waypoints. My source left me with the impression that the FBI were of the opinion that Sahari was responsible for the crash. Victor Ianello, an American engineer and member of the independent group, has done analysis on Zahari's strange particular flight simulation death route. 
Of all the profiles taken from the simulator, the one that mirrored MH370's final flight was the only one that Zahari did not run as a continuous flight. And that means he didn't take off and let the flight play out until it reached its final destination. He advanced the flight manually at multiple points, jumped forward, subtracted fuel at points until it was gone. Ian Ello believes that Zahari used the simulator to leave a breadcrumb trail to say goodbye. So strange. Uh, Billy fucking crazy last name met with the friend of Zahari who also happened to be a 777 pilot. And this friend also believes that Zahari was responsible for the tragedy. When asked about how Zahari would have dealt with getting uh, Farrakh Hamid out of the cockpit, this pilot who wished to remain anonymous in order to not offend or hurt the family of his dead friend said, that's easy. Uh, Farrakh was an examiner. All he had to say was go check something in the cabin and the guy would have been gone. He wasn't sure about a motive, but he said Zahari's marriage was bad. In the past, he slept with some of the flight attendants and his wife knew. None of this information was put in the official report and we don't know why. Uh, February of 2020, Australia's former prime minister, Tony Abbott, uh, prime minister when this flight went missing, said in an interview with Sky News Australia that top officials in the Malaysian government suspected the disappearance was murder-suicide. He said, I'm not going to say who said what to whom, but let me reiterate. I want to be absolutely crystal clear. It was understood at the highest levels that this was almost certainly murder-suicide by the pilot. Mass murder-suicide by the pilot. If this is what happened, it's possible that Zahari depressurized the plane a second time to end his own life. And then on autopilot, the ghost plane continued flying until it ran out of fuel. However, the way the plane likely crashed into the ocean suggests to many that someone was controlling it up until the very end. If true, how fucking dark and weird. Just flying for hours. The final hours of your life with a plane full of dead people that you killed. A plane full of 238 people, nearly a dozen of them co-workers that you knew or at least were acquainted with, just flying for hours with their bodies. Out over the sea, no land in sight. That is some creepy Twilight Zone shit. Tony Abbott said before the third anniversary of the disappearance, I have always said that the most plausible scenario was murder-suicide, and if this guy wanted to create the world's greatest mystery, why wouldn't he have piloted the thing to the very end and gone further south? Uh... And that's it. That's all the major points. All that we know. Technically, what happened is still a mystery. But based on debris found on beaches across the Indian Ocean, we know it crashed. And based on all the available radar and satellite communication data, we know the flight drastically altered its course. And instead of heading north to Beijing, turned to the southwest. We know the flight flew out over the Indian Ocean on a flight path that led to nowhere, nowhere safe to land, that is. Uh, we know that uh, same flight uh, was you know, simulated on one of the pilot's flight simulators. Someone took the plane in a direction that led to certain death. And one of two pilots, again, had a flight simulator that previously flew that same death mission. A man in a broken marriage, 53-year-old man, flirting with some young social media models who didn't respond to his flirtations. A guy maybe having a midlife crisis who seemed depressed, at least to some who knew him. A guy possibly growing estranged from his kids. A guy who could have definitely been suicidal, who sadly could have decided to take over 200 people with him to his grave that wouldn't be unprecedented. Is that what for sure happened? No. Is it what I definitely think happened? Oh yeah, 100%. Do I think Dick Quest also had something to do with it all? Did he maybe talk Sahari into getting fucked up on some meth, tying his neck to his dick and balls, throwing on some dildo-filled cowboy boots for a little late night, early morning stroll in a park, and then taking pics of him, and then trying to blackmail him with those pics? Is that what pushed him to do what he might have did? No. I want to think that. I want to think the story uh, is that crazy crazier actually i want aliens to be involved as well methed out kinky butt loving aliens but i think the truth is less funny and more just sad so sad and tragic right suicide isn't just suicide when you take others with you it's mass murder as your final act for zahari's family's sake i hope it's never proven with 100 percent certainty that that's what happened so they can at least hold on to some hope that he was also just a victim let's head now to today's takeaways time suck Top five takeaways. Number one, flight MH370 took off from Kuala Lumpur Airport, March 8th, 2014, and was never seen again. 239 people went missing, devastating families around the world. The search and rescue mission combined the uh, efforts and resources of multiple countries and spanned almost 100,000 square miles of ocean, but the plane nor the passengers were ever found. Number two, there have been several mysterious plane disappearances in the history of aviation, with the most well-known, at least in the U.S., being the disappearance of Amelia Earhart 
Another famous disappearance that led to the lore of the Bermuda Triangle was Flight 19. A group of pilots set out over the Atlantic Ocean on a training mission, reported having some trouble with their compasses, and then disappeared. And then the plane that was sent out to rescue them also disappeared, leading to 27 deaths. Number three, theories about what happened to MH370 have ranged from alien abduction in Asian Bermuda Triangle, stolen by uh, the Russians, uh, my dad being involved, uh, the plane being shot out of the sky by the US or North Koreans, to the pilot being seen parachuting out of the plane and maybe living on some remote island or something under a new identity. Number four, sadly, the most likely explanation for what happened to MH370 is pilot murder suicide. Mass murder suicide. Investigators suspect that Captain Zahari Shah intentionally turned off the plane's transponder to cut off communication with ground control. He steered the plane hundreds and hundreds of miles off course, flying until the plane was almost out of fuel, making a sharp turn, and crashing into the remote southern Indian Ocean. Shah most likely depressurized the plane, killing all passengers and crew except himself in just a few minutes. He most likely flew the plane until the very end, when it crashed into the ocean, never to be seen again. And number five, new info. I reference this up top. 2014 was the worst year for Malaysia Airlines. When MH370 disappeared, taking 239 people with it, it was the biggest aviation tragedy in the nation's history. And then on July 17th, a little over four months later, Malaysia Airlines Flight 17 was shot out of the fucking sky with a surface-to-air missile by Russian-controlled forces over eastern Ukraine. Fucking strong boy, pony boy Putin. All, uh, All 298 people on board, instantly dead. 283 passengers and 15 crew members. While Russia uh, would try and blame the Ukraine, or Ukraine, excuse me, uh, you know, of course, uh, numerous independent investigations proved that the Moscow-baked separatist forces, Moscow-backed, not baked, that'd be different. Uh, Moscow-baked separatist forces in Ukraine's uh, Donbass region, Donbass, I've heard it pronounced so many different ways, the Donbass a region mistakenly shot down the plane thinking it was a military aircraft. Two Russians and one Russia-supporting uh, Ukrainian were found guilty in a Dutch court just this past November. But because Russia does, you know, what it wants, they will never be handed over and uh, never be punished. Time suck. Top five takeaways. The mysterious disappearance of Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 has been sucked. Quest complete. Not as exciting as a dick quest, but at least interesting. And obviously so tragic. Uh, thank you to the Bad Magic Productions team for all the help in making time suck. Thank you once again to Queen of Bad Magic, Lindsay Cummins. Thanks to the Suck Ranger, Tyler C., for producing and directing today. Uh, thanks also to Bitelixer for upkeep on the Time Suck app and working on some upgrades right now. Thanks to the Art Warlock again for creating the merch at badmagicmerch.com for helping run our socials along with the Suck Ranger and a team managed by social media strategist Ryan Handelsman. Thanks to producer Olivia Lee for her kick-ass research this week. Also, th- thanks to the All Seen Eyes moderating the Cult of the Curious private Facebook page. It is the Cult of the Curious three out of five stars now. Uh, you know, I want to thank uh, uh, them, thank the Mod Squad for making sure Discord keeps running smooth. Uh, thanks to the people on the Time Suck subreddit and Bad Magic subreddit. Uh, the Cult of the Curious three out of five stars group is uh, admin by Bodie and Logan currently. And the mods, Donald Fisher, Michael Graham, Brittany Whitehouse, PJ Suniga, and DJ Arnold. And it's Bodhi Sunyata and Logan Keith. Uh, is Bodhi and Logan. Uh, next week, Shakespeare. Billy Shakes, baby. Billy Porkchops. Uh, considered by many to be the greatest playwright of all time. Shakespeare wrote over 30 plays during his lifetime and over 150 sonnets. Maybe. Some do think others actually wrote the stuff attributed to Billy Shakes. Uh, nevertheless, the official narrative is still that Shakespeare wrote plays like Romeo and Juliet, Hamlet, Julius Caesar, Macbeth, and many others. During Shakespeare's lifetime, he served as the primary dramatist for the Lord Chamberlain's Men, later renamed the King's Men, an acting company that performed in London in the late 1500s, early 1600s. The Lord Chamberlain's Men, one of the most popular acting companies in the London theater scene at that time, they had few rivals. Shakespeare's plays were in high demand. His plays were performed for large audiences numerous times, the royal, royal court. Shakespeare's friends within the Lord Chamberlain's Men recognized that he had a brilliant mind and after his death, They worked together to compile a folio for his plays to preserve his memory. Despite how famous Shakespeare was during his life uh, and his legacy that has lasted 400 years past his death, we don't know that much about the person. Uh, We know that Shakespeare was born in the town of Stratford-upon-Avon in 1616, grew up in an average family with a father who was a glove maker, civil servant, and illegal wool seller. So random. 
Uh, most likely received a standard education at the King's New School in Stratford-upon-Avon, where he learned to read and write in Latin and studied the classics. Shakespeare never went to university, married an older woman at the age of 18. They would have three children together, one of whom would tragically die in childhood. Shakespeare also disappeared for seven years, a period known as the Lost Years, then emerged in London, where he soon published his first poems and wrote the plays that made him a legend. Uh, in next week's episode, we'll discuss who was the real William Shakespeare. What do we know about him and the people around him? How was he an influential figure during and after his life? And of course, did Billy Shakes actually write his plays or did Dick Quest write them? All that and more uh, next week on Time Suck. And right now, let's head on over to this week's Time Sucker Updates. Updates. Get your Time Sucker Updates. I'm uh, going to kick things off this week with an old episodes update. Newer super sucker, Johnny Melanthin, writes, Greetings, King of the Suck and the Suck staff. Uh, I wanted to send in an update to the BSU Suck. During the episode, you talked about the interview with Ed Kemper. Mother! Uh, that interview was somewhat remade in an episode of Criminal Minds. In the show, it is another brutal serial killer, and he has two agents locked inside of the cell, agents Hotchner and Reed. In the show, Reed is able to buy time by stating he knows why you became a murderer. Basically, he just bullshits, talks a bunch of psychology until the guards show up. There's a lot of references like that in the show. I'm sure you know of a few after sucking so many serial killers. I've been trying to catch up on all the episodes. I'm currently on 204. My friend and loyal time sucker Kyle got me to start listening. I've been binging ever since. I've been waiting for a reason to write and now seem like the best time since I absolutely love Criminal Minds and the character Dr. Spencer Reed. You could say he is an inspiration of mine. Anyways, long message, but I won't apologize. Love everything you do. Praise Nimrod. Keep on sucking. Well, thank you, Johnny. Praise Johnny. Johnny Mill. Uh, I used to watch Criminal Minds all the time. So thanks for giving me an excuse to talk about that show. It's uh, such a fun show. Uh, I always, I like just watching it just to enjoy it. But also, it's it's good like just to have on background, on repeat. Has a nice like soothing rhythm to it somehow. Well-written, interesting, true crime-inspired plots and just a, a fun cast. And I actually interviewed Matthew Gray Goobler, the actor who plays Dr. Reed, about seven or eight years ago down in Burbank, California. One of the nicest, sweetest, coolest guys I met in all of showbiz. If you ever get the chance to meet one of your heroes, and that hero is Matthew Gray Goobler, uh, do it. Next up, Sweet Sack, Danny G. Made my fucking day. Writing... The witchcraft suck was so inspirational to me. I personally felt like this episode was more like some of the earlier sucks with the jovial attitude, random asides, and the piece in the end about defending others. I could feel the authenticity and conviction in that. The facts were very interesting. And like most sucks, I definitely learned a lot about the subject. I thought I already knew a lot about. Love what y'all do. Look forward to this uh, on my Tuesday morning commutes. Well, Danny, yes, I am trying to get back to the tone at the beginning of the show in, uh, in many ways. You know, it's been such a, a journey, a longer journey now. And he, sometimes I get lost in it. I've uh, been really focusing on just being the most authentic version of myself I can be uh, lately. Not that I was ever trying to not to, but just, I don't know, just like not being so worried about like, oh, what would people think if I say this? Or what would people think if I say that? <laughs> and uh, even if I'm tired when I happen to record, just trying to make sure to enjoy doing all this the, the most I possibly can. Uh, the past year, I just got kind of lost in my son, Kyler, graduating high school and getting ready for college. Such a big transitional moment in life uh, and other life stuff. And it just got busy and it, you know, threw me off uh, off my game a bit. Uh, when he got accepted into college and graduated high school, it was like such a weight lifting. Uh, such a feeling of like, ah, we made it. Mission accomplished. Didn't even realize how much energy, energy of mine was wrapped up in all that. And my daughter Monroe, she's about to start driving. And unless some crazy shit comes up, you never know. Uh, life might get less hectic, which gives me a bit more time to relax, reflect, which I've had the past few weeks have more fucking fun with whatever I'm doing. And I hope to add more of that fun into the show going forward. I always try and have fun with the episodes, but but more lately. Uh, so thank you again. And, and now a quick question from curious cult member, Heather W, who writes, hey, love your show. I was listening to your episode about Mark Bitchell Twitchell. That was a fun episode. And I found myself wondering if you've ever been confronted or otherwise contacted by someone you've covered. Please scratch my brain itch. Thank you, Heather. Uh, Heather, I, I've never been, uh, contacted by a direct subject. You know, I've never had like one of them write in, uh, or otherwise contact me, but I have been contacted by people like very close to the main subject of the show, like the, uh, the daughter or stepdaughter. I can't remember exactly which one. Uh, it's been a little while now of toy box killer, David Parker, Ray's accomplice, Cindy Hendy. 
Uh, she, she wrote in to tell uh, me that Cindy was getting out of prison and asked me if I wanted to be connected with her, if I remember that right. Uh, I did not want to be connected with her. I was, uh, if I'm remembering that correctly, I was looking forward to putting that subject behind me. I think I thought about it, but then it was just, nah. Uh, I have worried a bit here and there that someone I've called out for being like a piece of shit will show up one of my stand-up shows. Pretty easy to find me. On two or one of these days, uh, hopefully if that happens, it will lead to nothing more than just a, uh, a good story and not to me becoming a subject on somebody else's podcast. Uh, and lastly, charitable cultist, Katie Rusin writes, hi there. Are we able to recommend charities for consideration for the monthly donations? I would love to recommend a couple, but I don't want to bore you with a bunch of details if we're unable to. Thank you. Well, you are so nice. You're so polite, Katie. And yes, please do. Yes, you can. If any of you, have any 501c3 charities. We just need that. Uh, we need it to be to know it's a reputable, reputable charity, a 501c3 charity. If you're passionate about it, uh, you know, you want to recommend it, please send us an email to bojangles at timesuckpodcast.com. A lot of our charities have come from listener recommendations, some of the best ones. So thank you for thinking of that. And thanks everybody for listening. Thanks, time suckers. I needed that. We all did. Thanks for listening to another Bad Magic Productions podcast. A scared to death and time suck each week. Secret suck each week for space lizards. Uh, please don't decide to take over 200 people to the grave with you this week. Uh, don't be such a colossal piece of shit. Don't be, don't be a weak-minded fucking baby. Just talk to a therapist instead. And keep on sucking. Bad Magic Productions. Look, I, I know, I know, I talked a lot about Dick Quest this episode, but but how could I not? I mean, seriously, what was he thinking? If you're a public figure, and your name is literally Dick Quest, maybe don't ever walk around Central Park in the middle of the night with your balls tied to your neck. But I know why he did that. Meth. God, it's a fucking crazy drug.